so what we're going to begin with is just a brief, very brief, because we went on too long last week. Uh, we're going to begin with just with a brief look at where we stopped, uh, which was more or less where, when Detroit was founded in 1701. And we're going to remind ourselves that people uh, are coming back into the Detroit River area after the um, cataclysmic beaver wars uh, of the mid 17th century in which an, the inhabitants largely of the Michigan, the peninsula, the lower peninsula, the Ohio River Valley uh, were dispersed in uh, over several generations of war disease uh, with the Iroquois over be beaver. Now in 1701, that war is over, a treaty has been reached between the various groups uh, and trade can begin again in the Detroit River region. And so what you see is, as we discussed last time, uh, a Native American uh, uh, agenda to repopulate the Detroit region and then have access to the upper Great Lakes and the, the um, beaver trade in the upper Great Lakes and then the lower Great Lakes and into St. Lawrence River. Uh, so this is an incredibly important place. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so what people are coming from those exile communities say Green Bay and, and that area up there. And so what we're seeing when, when we see the Wyandotte and the Potawatomi and Odawa, we're not seeing the entire Odawa come down here. We're not seeing the entire Potawatomi come down here. We're not seeing the entire Ojibwa come down here. We are seeing pretty close to uh, what we would call the Wyandotte coming down here. But these are actually smaller groups. So the Potawatomi is just a kind of small group of Potawatomi uh, not the majority of Potawatomi that comes down to repopulate this area. And what that means is that we'll begin to see already at the founding of Detroit a somewhat divergence uh, between what were referred to as um, the Detroit Indians, the straight Indians, uh, and the other populations from which they come from. So uh, within several generations, the Potawatomi and the Detroit River will feel themselves enough separate from Potawatomi other places to insist on uh, negotiating uh, uh, on their own, for the, with their own position uh, with the Americans. So we're not seeing all of the Potawatomi. In fact, the majority of Potawatomi will, for the rest of this story at least, will continue to live in Wisconsin and western um, Michigan, Southern Illinois, Indiana, and then a little bit out into Iowa. Uh, um, one of the other things I want you to see here is uh, there's also Miami, uh, and the, there's many, um, the, the, the rivers in Northern Indiana where Fort Wayne are, the Elkhart River, the St. Mary's River, um, the Kanahaki River, those rivers uh, were uh, originally uh, we call them now Miami or Miami Indians, and, and they may have easily um, uh, had uh, territories that came up into the Huron River, Raisin River areas. So they're another uh, a group of people uh, um, who would have lived in this area. And the, and the Miami are an extremely important group, in fact, one of the largest, more complicated um, groups to go into uh, uh, here. So there are a lot of people. So remember when we were saying how difficult it is to do things like land acknowledgements in this area. So is Detroit Potawatomi land, Odawa land, Loop land, Fox land, Wyandotte, it's all of their land, right? Um, but what you're seeing is these villages are largely agricultural villages, right? So there's gonna be huge fields all around here. And it's the, it is not the Europeans and their farming that is gonna be feeding people. It is the Native American farming that will keep these several hundred Europeans, uh, French, alive. Uh, uh, so often we think that people are trading furs and stuff like that, but actually, especially on the Huron River, uh, Native people would be trading ex surplus corn that they grew into uh, Detroit. Uh, uh, and then, so, but what we see is, so how do these groups range from here? And what we see is going back to those watersheds. So there's an agreement, the Wyandotte, now, again, remember who the Wyandotte are. The Wyandotte are not the Wendat of history. They're claiming that. They are one group of one tribe of the Confederacy of the Wendat. And then the Patoon people 
and they come together in exile. Uh, uh, they're Iroquoian people, speak a very different language, matrilineal, very different than the Algonquin people. And then they will come down to Detroit almost as a whole, although there's, we can't go into the whole history of where they're at, but certainly in St. Ignace for a while. And then they come down to Detroit as more or less as a whole. And the, they are referred to by the French as the Huron, but in fact, they're not the Huron. The, the, the remnants of what the French refer to as the Huron uh, are largely absorbed into the Iroquoian nations, uh, the, the, the Six Nations and, and mainly the Seneca or uh, removed out to um, the St. Lawrence near Montreal, where they're still today called Huron people and, and, and largely uh, 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 converted to Catholicism. So the people up here are referring to that past. They're referring to their senior position in these relationships because trade was based on not who's the most important person, it's who had trade first you had then rights to that trade. So first come, first serve, and now you can negotiate away those rights, et cetera, et cetera, but first come, first serve. And the, the Wyandotte are the first people to create, in this group of people, an extensive trading relationship with the French. So they are the older brothers, they are the uh, uncles, um, the grandfathers of everyone else, because remember, we create familial relationships. So even though the Wyandotte are, are uh, Iroquoian speaking and matrilineal and, and lead very different lives than many of the uh, Algonquin speaking people around here, they are still the older brothers or the uncles or, or the grandfathers because of their primary relationship. And they will refer to themselves now as Wyandotte, right? So even though they are not Wendat specifically, they do trace a little bit of lineage to that, they are claiming that ancestry uh, and that role, more than the ancestry, they're claiming that role, right? And so um, I know that there's been some discussion about Huron, Wyandotte here in the United States. There has never been a group called Huron in the United States. In fact, um, in the 1740s, they will tell the French, please quit calling us Huron, we're Wyandotte. Uh, and then we'll separate from the French then as well. So that's who we're seeing here. And then again, we'll see a war let's go forward, in this French period, the Fox War. And this is a war, we think, between uh, people who had a claim earlier here, before uh, the expulsions in the mid-17th century, and, and Sock or Fox people that we refer to today as Sox, Sock or Fox people may have had a claim here, and there was a, a series of really violent wars. And one of the interesting thing about the French is, you know, we, talk, we talked earlier about how the French had a lighter touch here in the Great Lakes than some of the others. Not if you were Fox. <laughs> if you were Fox, the French were the the genocidal European maniacs. You know they. So so uh, again, it, these relationships are not universal. They're not universal. Um, one of the things that happens also in this period, 1730s, 1740s, is you get a frame. Uh, for a variety of different re reasons, you get a fraying of relationships with the imperial powers, uh, France and Britain and Spain to a lesser extent. Uh, and before then, it was actually the Dutch and the Swedish who were really involved up the Hudson River Valley. Um, uh, and you get a fraying of those relationships and you get um, what, are, what the French referred to uh, as the Republic. And they were referred to as the republics because they had no chiefs. They had no, or no, uh, the chiefs, the, the hereditary chiefs in those, in those communities in the Ohio River Valleys didn't play the same role uh, in other places. The, in the Ohio River Valley, you begin to see coalition or coalescing uh, villages that are multi-ethnic. So Seneca and Lenape and people are coming together and creating new identities an Indian identity, a specifically Indian identity. And that's happening in the Ohio River Valley. And the French refer to these towns and villages as the republics because they're not aligned to any of the monarchs, right? And I think it's really interesting they call them the republics. In this, in these, um, one moment, in these, um, uh, well, uh, this is an extremely egalitarian part of na the Native American world here. 
Uh, and so that's what's happening uh, in the Ohio River Valley in the 1740s. Uh, in 1745, there's a, an important split among the Wyandotte people, and that will um, uh, that is about relationships with the French, specifically the Jesuits. So the anti-Jesuitical -Je faction of the Wyandotte, and the Wyandotte are the only of these groups that will have had any number of their people uh, uh, converted into Catholicism or Christianity. It is remarkable that most, even though uh, the Christian missionaries tried for centuries to recruit um, members of the Ojibwa, Odawa, and Potawatomi communities, it's not until the 1840s that, that there's any success in that at all. The Wyandotte are somewhat of an exception, and you see the anti-Jesuits, the sort of, let's call them the traditionalists, although that's always a little bit complicated. They will separate here, and they'll move to the Sandusky River area, where Cedar Point is, in fact, today. If you ever been to Cedar Point, that used to be a, a, a very center of Wyandotte. And from there, they will develop very differently than the Wyandotte Detroit relationships with the British relationships with the British. And uh, and you will see a conflict between the Detroit Wyandotte and the Sandusky Wyandotte. And that will play out over and over again for the next several generations, in fact, several generations. Um, so that's important to recognize too. There are two, um, there are two groups of Wyandotte with different identities. In 1752, there was a massive smallpox outbreak. Uh, that will affect all of those villages uh, around Detroit. That was really disastrous. And then we get to what's called, and I know I'm going through this a little bit quickly because we went through so slow last time. But we get to what's called the French and Indian War. Now, remember how we were talking last week that wa wars are complicated. There are many different things. You know, there never is just one reason for a war or one reason for a group to go to war. There's many different reasons. And the French and Indian War is what we call it here. Uh, and it doesn't refer to a war between French and Indians, but that the French and India, because it's this, the name is from an American British colonialist perspective, right? The French didn't call it this, the Indians didn't call it this. The, the uh, Anglo Americans called it this, the people who are becoming Americans called it the French and Indian War, meaning the French and Indians were allied against them. Now, this is also part of a much broader conflict between uh, the British Empire and the French Empire, but it's also um, uh, a conflict uh, uh, about where the line of settlement will be drawn in the Americas. And, and, and remember, this is before treaties because there, there's not an America, right? There is a growing colonial um, system in the United States, of course. Uh, but there is not a United States. And one of the things that we see uh, in this is that this war is also in part sparked by those people who would become Americans. And so uh, uh, this is about land. And remember, the Americans are all about land. And a couple of leading speculators in, um, in this area down here where um, Virginia is, and you will recognize their name. One of them is George Washington, who was a slave owner and had made much of his money from his plantation, but his main moneymaker and his main power, in fact, was based on his enormous land speculation and ownership of land. Land speculation is going to be key to the story. It is the key motivating factor among the Americans, no doubt about it, land speculation. And it's not an accident that Thomas Jefferson, and George Washington are land speculators, and they will play a leading role in this. And so what you see is that these colonies claimed land just straight to the west of them. So as far, you know, like literally Pennsylvania would draw their line of claim all the way across the, all across the continent to the Pacific, right? So that's all of ours. And one of the, that one of the Northeast Ohio was claimed by the, by Connecticut straight across. So that's actually called the old Connecticut lands in Ohio. Even to this day, people will refer to it as that. So, and, and of course, uh, in Virginia is George Washington, and they want to begin a push over the Appalachian Mountains to 
speculate on land there because they own all of them. <laughs> I mean, it's not as if there's not tons of land. One of the issues is that uh, there is tons of land on the eastern seaboard of the what will become the United States, but it is held by very few large plantation owners, right? So it's not that there's no land, it's, it is already monopolized by relatively few very large plantation owners. So people who want access to land uh, and want to become plantation owners themselves, maybe, where do you go? Well, you have to go where, where somebody doesn't already own the land, which means squat and take it from some native people. And so uh, you see a, a squatting policy of people in the, and this will continue for generations, uh, in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains in the West. And of course, those people are attacked uh, by native people. And George Washington, who's a lieutenant or a colonel at this moment, uh, 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 raises a militia and gets the and fights with the British. He's a British colonel. This is not he's not a colonial. He's under the British Army, and they go in with General Braddock to try to push Native people out of kind of where Pittsburgh is, where the rivers come together that will form the Ohio River. Uh, and uh, and so that's the French and Indian War, right? It's it here. Remember, things are very specific to here. So even though this is wars also about British and French imperialism all over the place in Java and Africa and Europe. And then here, here it's very specific. It's about uh, the move of the colonists to get more land west of the Blue Ridge and, 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 and this will become a problem. Uh, and so there's a battle, July 9th, 1755, right down, kind of down in here. And it's called Braddock's defeat because George Washington and General Braddock did not win that. And they will not win a battle against native people until 1795, west of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, for 40 years, it, they were getting beat. Um, and so General Braddock uh, is destroyed uh, uh, in this area. If you've ever seen the movie, um, anyway, there's a movie that portrays uh, the Last of the Mohicans. It's a terrible movie, but it does portray this this event. Uh, uh, and and you will be interested to know that Native people from Detroit were central to that because Detroit, remember, is where the French sort of base is. And so this will be the staging area for raids into what is British territory and and will also be stationary into what's later American territory. And what interest, remember how we were talking about people here did not have horses. Uh, well, they got their first horses from General Washington. And so the first horses to, to, to be a part of the native communities on the Detroit River were taken from Braddock and Washington in this battle, 1755. So not only did they humiliate them militarily, they humiliated them by taking their horses and bringing them up here. And many of the horses that continued to live up here for generations would have been born from that original stock. So, um, that's what happens there. Now, again, this is a war also, but, you know, who's who's negotiating this? The French and the British. Now, the Native Americans of the Great Lakes and the Detroit River and even of largely of the Ohio River Valley don't lose a single battle in this process. In fact, they, 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 they do very well. One or two skirmishes they lose, but they do quite well in this conflict. Uh, two things come out of that. One is that those republics, the 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 creation of pan ethnic or pan tribal of uh, warrior societies, all lays the basis for larger and larger confederacies and larger and larger notions of Indianism, right? Of what it means to be a native person in this region. So it's not just people are going to; they're creating relationships, they're creating identities. Uh, and they're creating new centers of power, even within Native American communities uh, uh, in, in this process. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that happens here is something we will see again and again and again. And remember, Native people don't lose any battles, but the French lose a nasty battle at the Battle of Montreal and surrender to the British. Now, Montreal is not anywhere near here. It's, it's several days away, even today, several days away. Uh, 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 and so it wasn't a Native American defeat, but the, the French surrender their territories in North America because of that defeat. And so the Native people here who were not defeated 
they have to reconcile with the fact that the French will now, who were their allies in this last period against the colonialists and their British allies, and some native people sided with them as well, uh, uh, will now have to figure out a new relationship because the British are gonna be raising their flag over Detroit. So they had no say in this, of course. Native people were not part of these negotiations. And the King of France and the King of England are thinking about much broader details than Detroit in this process, right? Uh, but again, the imperial agendas and Native American agendas are not the same. Sometimes they coalesce and they will use each other and they're both very good at that, very astute at using each other. And then sometimes they just fly apart uh, where they have vastly different aims and agendas or and even victories on the battlefield. So native people have to surrender a territory they did not lose on the battlefield, which makes them incredibly uh, <laughs> hostile to the British to begin with, who they've also just fought a war with. And the British also do not deal with native people the same way. They're not interested in becoming the father. And that brings me to that, that these notions again. So you will often hear native people referring to the great father when they're talking about the French or the British or the Americans. And, and, and we, and I think there's this sense that that's people supplicating themselves and saying, I'm a little person, you're a big person, uh, you're the dad, I'm the kid. Okay, yes, they are saying that, but they're saying that in the very different context of a native family and how a native family would relate to each other. They're not referring to a European patriarchal system when they call the French king a, ma a father. They're referring to the relationship that a father would have in a Native American village. Now, a father in, a patriarchal father in Europe, does, you know, they coerce, they command, and they accumulate, right? A Native American, a father, in, at least in, in the Great Lakes that we're talking about in these communities, that has no ability to coerce. You mediate differences, right? That's your role as a mediator, not a coercer. And your role is not to accumulate goods, it's to disperse them. That's where your power lies, to me, in mediation and dispersal. That's what a father does, gives out the surplus, make sure everybody is fed, and make sure the fighting is done. Now, that's not what my dad did. <laughs> You know, like it's probably not what your dad did. Your dad said, no, you're you're over here and you're over here. That's not a Native American father, right? So so pe people, remember, you have to have, when you trade, when you do any kinds of things. Now, we can, tr you know, all we need is a dollar to trade. And you, can tr you don't have to speak the same language. You just show the dollar, you can trade. Native people, you had to create a relationship because this wasn't a market economy. Even though they exist on the fringes of a market economy, Internally, it does not exist for Native people, right? So trade is a familial relationship, one based on obligations and reciprocity and gifts and, and responsibilities, right? Uh, it is not, one moment, it is not, um, it is not uh, the kind of command you have here. A father in the Wyandotte, uh, and this is a matrilineal society. If a woman got, or a girl or a woman got pregnant, there's no, a father could not say, you're gonna marry this person or that person. In fact, uh, in this matrilineal society, the, the, all the men who would claim the child by claiming to have had relations with the woman, and that could be whether they really did or not, raised their hands and says, I'm the father. And the woman chooses who's the father, not on the basis of biology, but on the basis of her choice, right? And the father cannot coerce. So even in those personal, now of course you can have peer pressure and guilt tripping and all kinds of the things we do in our personal relationships, but there's not a mechanism to coerce this person. There's no jails, there's no uh, holding off of the dowry. There's none of that, right? Uh, the, 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 your personal, your pers if you're a member of these communities, your personal integrity, your personal, body is inviolable. Now, if you're not a member of these communities, you also, you have no rights, right? It's only by having this familial uh, uh, kinship relationship that you get rights and obligations. But you can create that. So again, when people are saying father or brother, think of it in terms not of your family, but of a Native American family, where the relationships are very, very different and much more egalitarian and less coercive. Uh, 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 the last thing to say about that in this period, the Potawatomi war leader who would have led these campaigns is a man named Ninawa. 
uh, uh, Pontiac, we call him Pontiac now, would have been a leader of the Odawa. There's several different war leaders of the Wyandotte. I think it's possible Nineveh is buried here in Ypsilanti or around Ypsilanti because the main Potawatomi uh, burial ground at post 1763, 64 um, will be in Ypsilanti. And then uh, it's also possible the other place where these warriors may be buried and where there's a large burial is if you've ever been on the, the bridge to Canada. You're going over the bridge to Canada, look down on your right, right there, and that's the old Potawatomi village, when you're crossing from the Detroit side, that's the old Potawatomi village and cemetery right there. Uh, and then under Cobo Hall was the first Potawatomi village there. So I want us to just take one more little look at these maps. And what you're seeing by the, the, the beige here is kind of the colonialists. And this is where Again, I think it's not, it's not just a political uh, 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 boundary, but beyond that boundary, Native people are an absolute majority. M many of the places within that boundary, they're an absolute majority, but it should be remembered. We call this the French period, but there are, again, one or two, three, four, five hundred French people in, in the Michigan area. There are many thousands of Native people. Native people would be a majority of what we now call Michigan until, let's say, 1825, 1830, something like that. So even 35 or 40 years after the Americans take control of Michigan, Native people will be a majority. One of the reasons it took so long for Michigan to become a state. Okay, so life in the Great Lakes woodlands. I, you know, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I think it's important to just kind of take a, a breath of how did people live? Uh, no romanticism, right? You know, I think uh, the village would be, from our perspective, our the way we most of us live today, not all of us, but most of us live today, it, the village would be extremely familiar. There would be things we would recognize immediately and feel comfortable with, and things that would be very foreign to our thinking. One of the things I always think about is because we take it for granted. The first, if you were to go into, if you were to go into a um, a native, you know, if you were to walk in as I'm dressed today into a Native American village today, you were to walk into a longhouse, the first thing that they would notice about you, the very first thing, is the overpowering smell of detergent on your clothes and in your hair and in your soap and stuff like that it would make their eyes water. It would make their, can you smell that? I can't smell it on me today. I don't even notice it, right? And I think you would, the smells you would smell inside of that building, you know, the, the leather, the, the, the boiling corn, the fish, uh, it would be uh, pungent to your, you know, and, and Native people in that, but they wouldn't think twice about it. It wouldn't be pungent at all. They wouldn't even notice it. So again, things we just take for granted. I don't smell like anything. Well, <laughs> my goodness, your detergent smells something else. Uh, and if you've ever been camping for a long time and come out of the woods and gone to the parking lot and smelled people just getting out of their cars, you can, it's, it's really oppressive. So I just want to say that is, you know, we don't even think about these things that are different or these things, you know, the way we live, but they would be very noticeable uh, then. And then other things would be completely familiar, the way families relate to each other, the way you relate to kids. Uh, uh, these are real people involved in real events right here, right? We don't need, we don't need to make any myths to make this interesting. We don't need to create anything up to make this uh, uh, real. And we don't need to uh, ignore some of the things that might be a little more uncomfortable to our sensibilities, like the regime of torture in these villages. Um, you know, like that would be very uncomfortable for us. And it was uncomfortable for some of the people in the villages. There's reports that people look away, right? Just like today, not everybody supports in the United States capital punishment. But if you were to look at the history of our country, you would say, why, these people are crazy for capital punishment, right? Um, uh, and the Huron River, and again, people, we saw where those villages are, but where are people dispersing during the winters, right? Where are they doing their hunting and some of the, some of the gathering? It's on these watersheds. And so there's an agreement, the Wyandotte, because they're the senior relationship, get the Detroit River, where everything comes into and flows through, right? So. They get to sort of tax all of that and have the, the legitimacy of it going through their hands. Uh, and then there was the agreement that the Odawa uh, would uh, uh, would have the Miami River Valley, where Toledo is, and the Potawatomi, the Ecorse, Raisin, Rouge, Huron River. 
Uh, and so that's interesting. You know, think of where the other Odawa live. That you know, when we were thinking about these these places and how we map these things out, other Odawa live north. You know, it's not congruent, right? And the Potawatomi are not congruent with the Potawatomi where they're living on the west. People are living among each other, and more so now than it probably at any time in the history. I'm sure that there was there was convergences before, but the the epidemics, the colonialism, the dispersal of peoples, all of that created uh, a much more multicultural, multi-ethnic, even multilingual world that even existed before. Uh, and this Huron River is very interesting. If you look at the vegetation zones on one side of the Huron River is beech maple, on the other side oak hickory. So you know, different woods have different purposes. You, some woods are are best for for uh, 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 creating tools. Some woods are best for creating buildings. You need a certain kind of wood uh, for the roofs of your houses that is waterproof. You need a certain kind of wood that has for fire that doesn't smoke much. So you know the the landscape, uh, and then you will have cops trees. You will you will you will grow a tree for the next generation, even though you will have no role in it. The next, you will know that the next generation has a good yew tree or what, not a yew tree, but a good tree to have a bow or whatever. So these things are managed. There's there there there's firing. In fact, one of the one of the early Wyandot names for the Huron River is the Burnt Oak region, and that that gives you a sense again of the activity. The Burnt Oak is not an event; it's an activity of people burning and managing this land. Burning was a major part of the management of this land. Uh, so we have these fertile bottomlands here, you know, uh, where where the um, uh, uh, where Ford Lake is today would have been Native American um, uh, um, fields. And we know also uh, Barton Lake. And, the, and we know the fields there were massive cornfields under where Barton Lake is. And they date to a much earlier period, were not Potawatomi fields. Uh, the, so the forests are for hunting, deer, bear, and small game as, where, as well as for forage and wood, and women are in charge of gathering the wood uh, each spring, early spring, before the leaves come out, and, and, uh, and then the second thing you would do right after that is uh, the maple runs. So the women have these big sort of logging camps. Uh, and the maple, um, maple grove here for the Ypsilanti village would have been uh, sort of eight mile uh, and what is now kind of prospect. So Warden is the area up there now. And it was described as a mile wide maple leaf areas. And so you would have gone up there and, and the women and young girls would have gone up there in spring. Again, you would move your villages when firewood is depleted, the soil is exhausted, the trash piled up. However, their lifestyle rarely threatened their lifestyle. Our lifestyle will kill all of us. <laughs> you know, like our lifestyle is not sustainable. So, of course, Native people affected their environment. Of course, they depleted the so soils. Of course, they knocked down all the wood in the air. Every, 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 every being to live relates to their environment and takes some, you know, but the way they did it allowed it to regrow. It, it wasn't a depletion, right? It wasn't a depletion. And there were all kinds of sort of rules of the game that prevented you from doing that. You know, you could only take, you would only hunt, um, you would only hunt, uh, I mean, and then again, it becomes complicated with the beaver wars because you're adding a different element. Uh, so you would only hunt uh, a beaver in a certain pond every three years, say, but then get this situation. So that's the normal way you would do it. And that would ensure ensure the beaver would be there for a long time. But if the beaver wars are going on and you're not sure if somebody will come to your lake and take the beaver, and they probably will because there's much competition for it, then you're compelled to take the beaver before somebody else does, even though you might not need it, right? Otherwise you'd lose the beaver entirely. And so that pressure of the trade will disrupt the normal ways you do things. Right, uh, and so there are not a lot of, there are thankfully some now beaver again on the Huron River near Dexter, and we're gonna go see them soon, I hope. Uh, but for a while there were very little beaver here and it wasn't French people who killed them all, right? Um, uh, uh, 
these villages have their own interests, right? So they invite trade and they seek advantages. Like they, they're, 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 there's competition, but it's a different kind of competition. It's a, a kind of competition to, you know, our competition is how rich can you be? And that, you know, the richest person in the world. And then we know, I mean, like, how, why in the world do I know who the richest person in the world is? You know, I don't know who the poorest person in the world is, but I can name like the top three richest people in the world. That is not the way this world works. To be, um, to be, to be the most powerful person in the community means you have the most access to goods to be able to distribute them and give them as presents, right? So, if the most powerful person will, their power may often be that they're the poorest person because they've given it all away, and that's their authority. That and, and it's, it's it's an inviolable authority. So different than what we have here. Um, and then you have uh, you have uh, summer in the village, late summer into early fall in the village, and then uh, in often, though not entirely, the village would break up uh, during winter to live more lightly on the land. So family groups would go live on the watershed somewhere, and maybe the old and young people would stay in the village throughout the the year. Uh, but again, these are permanent villages. You know, like that doesn't make you a nomad. It means you're moving in the landscape uh, like we're moving in our houses from room to room to room. Now, there are not class differences. There are not hierarchical differences, but there are real differences. And those differences create conflict within these communities. These are incredibly egalitarian communities. Uh, might even call them communist communities. They are that. This is a commons. Things things are, uh, you, you can't take from someone else. I mean, that's just not, it's like a water fountain. Uh, there are, of course, exceptions. Uh, um, but there are real differences in gender, gender roles, and then the most important difference, and the difference that causes the most conflict within these villages is, is generational. Because you get your authority in this village on the base of your authority, on, 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 on the bones you make in life, on your ability to hunt, on your ability to sow the corn, on your ability uh, um, uh, to fight, uh, on your ability to heal, all of those things. It's a, it really is a meritocracy. Now it helps to have a good family name and a good lineage. But remember, if you're a member of a clan, you're related to everybody in that clan. I am not related to the most powerful people in my community. Everybody in these villages would be personally related to the most powerful people in their community by being, ver by being members of, of clans, right? And so you get to lead a clan by your authority. You have to gain authority over time. If you're younger, you have to fight to get that authority. So you are constantly see sort of the older people going, everybody calm down. Let's, you know, let's get along to get along. And the younger, especially the younger men are going, oh, I need to make my phone so I have authority later. And this constantly creates conflict. And because we don't have, there's not a way to coerce. I mean, the old people can't say, hey, guys, shut it down. That's, you know, so they're constantly going, you know, when they want to negotiate and go, you know, these young men are just unmanageable. I don't know what to do with, you know, I can't do anything about it. They were the same unmanageable young men when they were younger. That's how they got the authority to be the peacetime people in, in, in charge. So that generational difference creates quite a bit of conflict. Uh, uh, and it, it, it's not a class difference, but it is a difference of power and, how, and, and those kinds of things. And then the, gener and then the gender differences. Now, gender, div gender division of labor is not necessarily oppressive. And one of the interesting things we find is that the... Potawatomi, let's say, the Anishinaabe people here who are patrilineal will have a very, very similar gender division of labor as the matrilineal Wyandotte. Uh, and, uh, and so that's really interesting to me. That's really interesting to me. And because you get such time spent, because that division of labor is real, men, men in both Wyandotte communities and in in Anishinaabe communities are not the farmers. They'll clear the fields, they are not the farmers. Now men in American communities are the farmers and for native people that was women's work. For native men that was women's work. So when they were told they had to become farmers, they were being unmanned, right? Can you imagine telling all the Marines that they have to become nurses? A lot of them would resist that, right? They would, would be like, what? You know, and, and so that to become a farmer was to do women's work. But it also meant that the women 
were the people who made the decisions largely about where the villages were, when the farming was. The women were the people who organized the daily work in 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 both the matrilineal and patrilineal. They were the, the people who organized the daily work. Let's get get in fact to that these genders. So you can see the different gender roles between. And again, these gender roles are different both in matrilineal societies and patrilineal societies. And again, I'm being very specific to these egalitarian communities in the Great Lakes. I'm not talking about east of here, west of here, south of here. Um, uh, the other thing is that, you know, because because these it's about being responsible, you don't make tool, you know, like the women had to make the tools that they would use. The men would make the tools that they use. The men use tobacco. So they're the ones who broke tobacco. Right. Uh, so that, that's responsibility. But on the dispersal side, you give that to somebody else. So the person who hunted the bear was not in charge of dispersing the food of that bear. It was given to someone else. And then you'd have to apologize always for not for there not being enough. So you had to kind of humble yourself and then you did not have control over the dispersal of that. All of these things are were uh, to reinforce the equality of, of, of people in this community and to stop uh, jealousies and pettiness, right? Because everybody knows in a small tight-knit communities, those things will be extremely destructive. And one of the ways you'd stop those pettinesses is this wonderful um, ceremony held by the Wyandotte around our Christmas time, around the, um, uh, uh, the winter solstice. There would be a ceremony where you, you would go and make, no, you, would, you would have a dream. Dreams are really important, right? And uh, you would dream about what you wanted that somebody else had in that community. And you would make lots of noise and go from door to door to door. And if the person, and that's it, uh, if they could, you know, give you the right item, then that person was so amazing, right? So again, this is about, so you would go from place to place asking for the right item that you wanted. And if you were given it, it wasn't you who was the, the winner of that situation. It was the person who gave it to you because they could have seen your dreams and all of that. They were connected to that. And that, um, and that, so that was another way of dispersing goods, right? So different from the way, you know, <laughs> if I knocked on your door and said, I would like that, you would shoot me. In America, you'd get shot for doing that, right? So, so different. The clans are also very important. The clan roles are, were very important earlier. And because of the disruption of the, the original villages and original political polity that those, um, those clans informed the clans play a different role now not saying clans are not important but they do play a much different role than they did uh previously when there was a, sort of a commonality of villages and locations and stuff like that where you where you could play the daily role of your clan within the larger society now most of these clans you will see th these are potawatomi clans most of them you will see are named after animals, although not, not all. There's also the human clan and all of that. And it's important to recognize that that wh what what did people call themselves, right? And so Pot the people did not call themselves Potawatomi. They did not call themselves uh, uh, Ojibwa. They, these are these are names in, uh, created in negotiation, right? Uh, mo almost all of these groups called themselves the people, right? Anishinaabe. The people and it's not a way to differentiate yourself from, from the rest of nature you know i'm the people your nature it's there's the bear there's the tree there's the fish and i'm the people in this situation right so it's identifying yourself within the larger environment it is not excluding yourself from that environment and then the other interesting thing is you know each one of these these and i can't go into all of this but the clans you know these names are not just names because people like elks right they're connected to deep stories deep traditions deep ways with understanding things and they will have multiple meanings so a beaver will have multiple meanings a beaver will have the meaning of, from the many different stories the beaver plays a role in the beaver will have metaphorical meaning the beaver will have spiritual meaning the beaver will have historical meaning all of those meetings are layered and layered and layered on top of each other. So it's not just a totemic symbol. Don't think of it as that. It's not just that. And many of these, um, many of the stories of the original clans are 
of a human being sort of lost and alone in the environment who seeks help. And that help is often given by one of these animals, right? And so your relationship with that animal, that particular relationship allowed you to survive. And then that creates a kind of identity you have with that animal and your connection with the broader stories that that animal lives with within your cosmological universe, right? So it's not just saying I'm be, it's connecting to these long stories and long traditions uh, with metaphors of meaning, not just one meaning. Uh, so I think that's important to understand. These are not just totemic symbols. They're, they're full of really powerful meaning and, and a directive of sort of how you're supposed to live your life. Okay, this is the commons. Uh, look at these garden beds around Kalamazoo. Look how they're created. I read an early report of, um, of uh, near Dexter where a young, uh, and, and this is in the 1820s, and so the cornfield is still up, so people are living here, at least in small numbers, even well after the defeat in the War of, of 1812. And uh, uh, these, he said he would walk through the gardens and it just seemed like they were higgly piggly. But then when you got up on the field, you could see there were these marvelous geometric shapes. And what, and you could see this is big, 25 feet there, 30 feet out there, 10 feet there. And these are sort of like furrowed, right? These are not, these would, the way you, you would mound up dirt and then plant in that dirt, right? Uh, so you wouldn't plow in, you would, mounded up and so these are mounds there ooh, 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 going the wrong way these are mounds there uh and and so again these also probably have all kinds of meanings and stuff as well as the things you can do with you know and being imaginative and expressive uh you know when we think of hunting look at this when we think of hunting we you know we think of it the way we would hunt right which is you'd go out you know maybe you and your grandpa or you and your, your granddaughter go out hunting you know it's a singular event or with a small group of people. But, you know, for a hunting party might be a hundred people and you might create, you might go to an island and create a mile long wood fence created like this and then draw, you can see the people here driving the deer into this fence where then the animals would be dispatched by people with spears at the end of the fence here. So we're looking at dozens, if not hundreds of people involved, and then the community would gather to process the meat, to dry the, the to dry, you know, and then have ceremonies and stuff around that. So these were big events. This is an actual photograph, and you can see the, the bridge going up to the UP there. So this isn't that long ago of Ojibwe a, a people in the whitefish uh, uh, harvest in, in uh, the St. Mary's River uh, uh, um, uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. And that's another really interesting thing is because we live in the Great Lakes, we have um, we have uh, regular, massive, routine, set your watch by it, uh, uh, more than you could ever eat buffets of protein that happen, right? When the sturgeon, the whitefish, the salmon come up to spawn. And so, especially on the Miami River, down south where Toledo is, where the falls are, and then these falls here, these are gathering places for, for people from hundreds of miles around who would gather to, to, to fish in these areas. And again, trade and do, you know, these big, huge gatherings from, from you know, some of them would be region-wide gatherings where you would meet to trade. The other thing that's interesting about that is this also allows you to place yourself permanently in the landscape with a regular supply of food that is always there. So we often think that agriculture is what gives people the ability to permanently live in one place because they have a surplus of that and they also need to tend the fields. Uh, but, you know, in certain places like the Pacific Northwest, like the Great Lakes was also the ability to have huge amounts of fish any time of the year, any time of the year. Okay, so now Pontiac's Rebellion. So um, we are in the situation, again, remember where 1759, the French are defeated uh, uh, and Britain takes over Detroit without the native people being defeated. In February 10, 1763, there's the Treaty of Paris, which codifies that. Uh, on April 27th, there's a uh, meeting, so this is two months later, 
on April 27th, there's a meeting uh, at Council Point on the Ecorse River, and I was honored to be able to write the Michigan Historical Mon Marker for that. Uh, uh, it's called Council Point, and there uh, we call him Pontiac. I'm just going to use that name. Uh, Pontiac, uh, who's an Odawa, who was born up in Orchard Lake in Oakland County, at least that's what we think. Um, uh, uh, remember, we have we have these nascent confederacies. We have groups of Native people who have been uniting and fighting for a long time, but this is much more broad. And we don't necessarily know if Pontiac is the instigator or the of the national thing or or just really prominent locally. But we do know uh, that within days of that April 27th uh, meeting, all across the eastern part of the United States, British ports fall to United Native American Confederacy attacks. In fact, almost every single British fort will fall within a fortnight, except two, Pittsburgh and Detroit, Pittsburgh and Detroit. Um, but it is a massive, you know, and to think that there's no way it could be anything but incredibly coordinated, you know, it, to be able to attack um, dozens of uh, Michigan forts on a front uh, a thousand miles long. Uh, yeah, that was coordinated. Uh, uh, and to have victory after victory after victory after victory. Uh, St. Joseph fell here where Niles is. That fell very quickly. Uh, uh, Fort Mackinac, it was called Michelin Mackinac then, uh, falls very quickly. Detroit, there is a siege, and many people have heard about the, the siege. Um, uh, uh, there's one attempt to break that siege. Uh, one there's one attempt to really break that siege, and that's July 31st, 1763, with the British trying to march from outside to break it. If you ever go to Elmwood Cemetery in Detroit, on the east side of cemetery, there's just the smallest little stream left in all of Detroit. Everything else has been covered with asphalt. There's a little stream going through Elmwood Cemetery that's called Bloody Run. Why is that called Bloody Run? Because Pontiac and his comrades wiped out wiped out the British on that as they were attempting to break the siege of Detroit. Now, uh, again, people have responsibilities, and this Confederacy doesn't mean that Pontiac can command anybody. You can't command. You must agree, right? And by, by fall, you need to get back and feed your family. You need to start your hunting. You need to take in the corn. You've got work to do, right? You, you ward, say, between June and August, and then you had work to do the rest of the year. And so what we see is the Potawatomi break the siege. They say, we're going, we're going home. Uh, and they're the first to do it. And they come to a separate peace with the British. And that phrase this, right? And eventually uh, 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 a formal treaty to end hostilities in 1766 between British and, uh, the British Empire and Native people happens. But something more important happens in the meantime. Now, Pontiac is a major leader. He will be assassinated near St. Louis was actually at this point, um, believe it or not, Spanish. So we'll see a lot, a lot of even Spanish coins in Native American graves here. And that's because Spain, the Spanish Empire is just over there during this period. What you're looking at here, that, oh, let's go back real quick. This is a picture of Jefferson Avenue, believe it or not, in Detroit. And Elmwood Cemetery is right to your right. And this tree, which only fell down a few, like a few decades ago, uh, 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 was called Pontiac's tree and it had bullet holes in it and was said that's where Pontiac fight fought from uh, during the battle. And so that was, this is what, 150 years after that was taken. Uh, and I, I have no doubt that that's true. The landscape was full of these kinds of things. It's not there anymore, but you can go to exactly where this tree was. Okay, so the major thing that happens, and this will set up for, let me take a drink real quick. The major consequence of the Pontiac's rebellion and the defeat of the British in every single corner of of North America where they was that was contested, except two, there was a major uh, consequence of that, and that it will have it will reverberate. It reverberates today, and what that was is that the British said, "Okay, you, <laughs> we realized you did not win that." We did not win that. We realized we cannot continue with this situation. And so a line on the uh, where the watershed is, so these watersheds are so important. So anything east of the watershed flows into the uh, um, 
into the Atlantic Ocean. Anything west of the watershed will flow into the Mississippi Ohio River Valley. So east of the watershed is where the colonists have rights to settle. West of the watershed, the British would enforce a no settlement rule. And private land purchases, the kind that that Thomas Jefferson and George Washington made most of their money on were outlawed. All future land transfers had to be made, made through the crown, not through land speculators. Uh, colonists were barred from settling on native lands. Military posts were set up on the frontier to monarch con co colonists. And that British imperial military then taxed the colonists to keep those military there. So you can see where this is heading. This is one of the main issues that heads to the complaints of the colonists against George III and the American Revolution. So the consequence of Pontiac's Rebellion is that the British enforce a do not settle line in the landscape. And then what they would like, the British, remember how we said the British were interested in empire more than anything else? They want to use this Native American land as an independent buffer state. The British official policy is to create a Brit an independent native buffer state to keep the American colonists from relating to the Spanish and French out here, right? So they're ha they have an imperial world. It's not about we love native people, they have a right to self-determination. That's not what this is about. But native people go, okay, that's the way you feel about it. We will, <laughs> we'll, let's come to an agreement, right? Obviously, obviously. Uh, 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 and so this line in the landscape becomes incredibly important. And the first people to push over that line are going to go into Kentucky. And so let's look at the American War of Independence. What we're looking at here, does anybody know what these two lines are from? They're from the Declaration of Independence. So let's read Thomas Jeff, what, the most vaunted cry for liberty in United States history, and often considered the much more radical document than the Constitution, which is in some ways a very conservative document. And the, uh, the Declaration of Liberty starts beautifully. We all know it does. But read what Jefferson, what were the complaints? Well, one complaint was he, meaning George III, has endeavored to prevent the population of these United States for that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of per foreigners, so no more colonists can come in, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hithers and raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. You're, you're, you're not allowing us to buy more land. And that's what we're here to do. We're not here because we love the climate, George. We're here to make money. And he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us. Well, that's, yeah, he promised slaves freedom for supporting. <laughs> okay, so part of the complaint is we can't take Indian land and the, sla and the slaves are rebelling amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's in the Declaration of Independence. So what Jefferson is saying is along with the, you know, the rights of man, Indians were not human beings. Black people were not human beings. So he's not being hypocritical. He just thinks only white people are human beings, right? But that's the reality. Part, and again, the American Revolution is many, many, many different things. For Sam Adams, the, you know, and the Paul Revere and the Minutemen of, and the artisan workers of, of Boston, it was one thing. For the big plantation owners of South Carolina, it was another thing. You know, it was many different things. For Native people, it was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. Uh, and here you see in, in, in 1963, to commemorate the 200th anniversary of that, the United States issued this coin, proclamation bars from moving west. And with these hardy pollock, look at this nasty, you know, he's telling these poor people that they can't go settle on that land. Now, there were some poor people who wanted to settle on the land, but I'm going to tell you that who was really angry was George Washington and his class of people, right? Uh, but this is the way we want to remember it. October 7, 1763, the king issues a proclamation which seeks to check the colonists. They're not really, they're just, you know, westward advance until the Indians can be agreed, persuaded to agree to add its settlement. Is that what happened? They just needed to be persuaded to agree to add its settlement? So that's the view 200 years of the United States after it. And my guess is it's probably still the view. 
uh, what you see is that in the 1760s, that, that line, a whole lot of people start violating that line, you know, and we've heard their names, Daniel Boone, like the, all of those people who are celebrated, as the, they're the squatters, right? They're the ones who are breaking that line who are breaking, in fact, the law to come to take Indian land where they're not allowed to in Kentucky. And so that sets up a huge conflict. Uh, you can imagine, this has been, there have been no European settlers here taking native land. That is, this is the first time that's happened. And it's happened without the authority of, of even the US government or the colonial government, certainly not the British government. So what you see is a beginning of a major conflict between they are really terrible people. If you read the history of the Kentuckians in this period, they are genocidal nutcases, but they are, you know, Simon Kenton. Our landscape is filled with their names. These are the, the Indian killers. These are the people who did this, and maybe that's even Simon Kenton here. The Nottahutton massacre in 1782. These are a massacre of Lenape Indians who have converted. They're Moravians, they're Christians, they live with white people. And they they think that they're gonna be safe because they're converted living in houses with white people. No, you're not safe, you're an Indian. And Simon Kenton, and I don't know if it was Simon Kenton, but the Kentuckians went up there and massacred those entire people. What was left of that community actually moved up to where Mount Clemens is today on what is now the Clinton River and then would move over to the Thames River. And in fact, Tecumseh would die within yards of their reserve on the Thames, the Thames River. So what you see here, so here's the American advance in the, in the War of Independence, right? And he, Detroit is the base from which Native people are launching attacks. So Detroit is key, is key to Native American resistance. It's where it's supplied with guns and ammunition from the British, but it's also where you meet and organize. The Great Lakes can, you know, it's, as we said before, this is a gathering area for all kinds of things. Okay, so Let's look in, in the 1770s and 1780s that the American Revolution is happening. And here there's a war of resistance against those colonialists, those frontiers people, the Daniel Boones who are moving in. And uh, it's at this point that we're gonna see the Shawnee really become central to this story. They become, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to underestimate how this relatively small, Hard to underestimate the role this relatively small group of people would play in history. They were, uh, uh, you know, a many remarkable people. Uh, so you have constant attacks on settlements in uh, during the American War of Revolution and huge raids down into Kentucky. And here's where I get to tell a personal story uh, because these things affect everybody. My wife, Lisa, who is on this call, uh, is only in Detroit because her direct maternal line, my, her grandmother's 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 grandmother, two generations on her direct maternal line were women who were hiding in a little, in a, a place called Ruddles Station during Byrd's attack on, um, and, and, and Blue Jacket, the great Shawnee warrior Blue Jacket's attack on American, uh, now they were German speakers from Pennsylvania, but they were settling in this area on, on uh, settlements in 1783 in Kentucky, and they were kidnapped. They were taken hostage. They were taken prisoner, uh, along with some of them were killed, and many people were taken prisoner, and they were brought back to the Detroit area and held on um, and adopted into Native American families, and Lisa's family would have been held on to uh, in, in Gross Eel, which was where most of these people were held, and then married into the family. And in fact, they would become Indian. And uh, some of Lisa's relatives would have fought, they're white, would have fought with Native Americans and died at the Battle of uh, Fallen Timbers because of this process. So my wife is only in Michigan. The first people, her, her, her family history to come to Michigan is because they were taken on direct uh, maternal line in this raid down here. Um, now the Civil War ends, or the Civil War, the, the American Revolution ends in 1783. And again, Native people didn't lose any battles. There's one battle over in Vincennes where George Rock, Rogers Clark does quite well, but they never get anywhere near Detroit. They don't take any of this land. Uh, Native people, again, they win all the battles. The British don't, and the British sue for peace. Now. Again, uh, uh, you can see how this would create a conflict. Why in the world do we have to give up land if we did not lose a single battle for it? That's ridiculous. And 
question also, how, how does the, the guy living in London get to negotiate for our land? He's never even been here. I don't, it, it doesn't compute to us, right? But in this process of these wars, a confederacy is born and it is a real, it, in fact, it is the most powerful Native American confederacy, in my opinion, in, in, in the history of this area that we know of, or the history of North America that we know about. And this confederacy would fight the Americans for two generations to a standstill. They had incredible successes against the Americans. Uh, further epidemics, again, remember these don't go away. They just roll through and roll through and roll through. One of the important things is because after the treaty gives so much land to the Americans, now, in theory, all of the land in Michigan should go to the Americans too, but it's going to be another 10 or 15 years because they get here till they get here because first they have to defeat the Native American resistance. The British are defeated, but not the Native Americans. And so the Native Americans, that confederacy, and that confederacy will have representatives from all over east of the Mississippi, Mississippi, all the way down uh, Creek and Cherokee, Chickamauga people uh, in the south, all the way east. Uh, uh, Iroquoian people who used to fight with the Anishinaabe people here will come together and the creation of a council fire and the headquarters of the council. So the capital of the Confederacy is in Brownstown, which is right at the base of the Huron River. If you've ever been to Carleton High School on Jefferson Avenue, if you look out in the field over Brownstown Creek, it's fortunately the area where one of the most, if not the most important historic Native American village in this entire region ever is is now uh, held by the um, uh, 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 the Detroit uh, River Wildlife. So it's a fed, it's actually a multi Canada is involved in that as well. So it is protected. It has never been dug. It's never been destroyed. Part of the the high school was on it, um, um, but it's right there, and it's a remarkable thing. You can walk right through where this village was. Um, uh, so in the 1780s, then you have the defeat of the British, not the defeat of the Americans. And one of the things you get is the Americans also say, we can't have this Kentucky business because it's nothing but squatters. And how in the world are you going to determine who has right legal access to the land? I mean, we're actually, we're doing all of this to be able to bring this land into the market. And we can't do all of that unless we, the title is clear. So if the title is not clear on your house, you can imagine, you know, if there's a, you know, you look in the back and, you know, the title has to be clear. Otherwise, you can't sell it. That's the way our market works. And this Kentucky, if you even look at the way land is divided in Kentucky, it's all higgly piggly. It's crazy. And so part of the creation of the U.S. military and the Northwest Territory Act is take, to take control of the uncontrolled settlement of this area. Right, and to make sure that that the land has a title, and when it enters the market, it's clear where it entered the market from, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why we get those grid system, that beautiful, terrible grid system that is imprinted on our landscape and will be there for a very long time, unfortunately, very long time. Uh, now, the United States is not yet engaged in a war. The colonies engaged in a war, and the colonial army engaged in a war. Guess what the first war the United States will engage in? And guess what the, re the reason the United States created their first army? To take the Ohio River Valley from the Native American Confederacy. So uh, after the American Revolution, remember they, they were all about the militia and the Second Amendment and no standing army? Well, those Native Americans changed that. We're gonna need a standing army uh, and it will be designed you know, <laughs> not to defend ourselves from King George or the French or the British, the, the, some empire anywhere, us plucky colonialists. No, it will be to take land from Native people who are resisting fiercely us taking that land. So here, we've already had several wars for this land. This is a, these are wars of conquest. These are wars of conquest. Um, and so in the 1780s, you get the Northwest Indian Wars, the beginning here. It's the first the United States first wars, the creation of the U.S. Army to take the Ohio country, the Northwest Territory is led by a Miam nah, the, 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 the people, the authorities, at least as, as the Americans see it, are Little Turtle, who's Miami, and Blue Jacket, who's Shawnee. The Huron uh, uh, 
Potawatomi are conspicuous in the Battle of Harmer in 1790 and the Battle of Wabash in 1791. At the Battle of Wabash in 1791, this native, all of these are victories. At the Battle of Wabash, in everybody here has heard of Crazy Horse and Little Bighorn. How many have heard of 1791 and the Battle of Wabash and Little Turtle? Well, Little Turtle, the, the Native American Confederacy in November 1791 was able to wipe out one quarter of the entire standing American military. They killed the virtually the entire army sent to destroy them. About a thousand uh, soldiers were killed in the Battle of Wabash, which is four or five times the number killed at, um, at uh, uh, Little Bighorn. It was the largest defeat ever suffered by the, in, in terms of percentage of fatalities, ever suffered by the United States military ever anywhere in a campaign. And it was done against, again, the resistance here was ferocious. And that you can imagine how the native people here must have thought they were invincible. We, we think that Europeans came and rolled over native people. Are you kidding me? Not here they didn't. Not here they didn't. They must have thought they were invincible. They had beaten and thrown back everything sent against them, including a whole army. They, they wiped it out. So what happens is the United States says, we're going to have to take a little more time to do this. And they send a guy named Wayne, Mad Anthony Wayne, down to Cincinnati. And they're going to spend three years training and organizing on how to fight Native people and slowly build up a series of forts from where Cincinnati is, up the little Miami River, Dayton, Hamilton, all of that, build, slowly build up to try to get here. Now, remember, this is American territory. It was ceded to the United States by Britain. Why do they have to fight for it? Because Native people are resisting. This is, that's why, not because the British. The British flag will fly in Detroit until 1796, not because the British defended it, but because Native people resisted in this entire area, right? Uh, and this finally, after three years, um, Wayne's Legion gets as far north as they have ever gotten, which is just south of Toledo. And it's, uh, it's hard to explain what happens at the Battle of Fallen Timber, but there the Native people lose the field. And there's a couple of reasons that they lose the field. Uh, um, but they lose the field to the American advance at the battle. It's not a huge battle and it's not a terrible military defeat, but they do lose the field. The problem is they think that the British, who are, you know, who have guaranteed them that they're going to fight for this to be a independent Native American area, and they have a fort maybe two miles from the battle, and the Native Americans retreat to that fort because these are their allies, and they have an agreement and the British closed the doors on the Native people at that very moment. Uh, and that creates a real crisis within the Confederacy. If we don't have, I mean, again, Native people do not produce shot and shell for guns. They must trade for it. If they are cut off to trade for that, they cannot fight the Americans. They must have access to those weapons. And the British just denied them those access. So what happens is internally, the, the, the uh, Confederacy phrase, because people have disagreements about what's possible anymore. So even though the Battle of Fallen Timbers is not a disastrous military defeat, it's disastrous politically. And it means that the Confederacy is, is, is hobbled. It's reached its point where, you know, where, where it, it, it's done what it can do. Now the Confederacy is remarkable. I mean, they read the newspapers. They're, they're not in isolation over here. They even write from Brownstown an appeal to the U.S. government that says, instead of, instead of spending all of that money to make an army and have us kill and die and fight, use that money and settle your poor people on land you already have, and we will not have to fight. They knew what was going on. They, they literally read, put a document out saying that Joseph Brandt, an Iroquoian leader had actually lived in London. He knew these people very, very well. He knew their situation very, very well. So what happens is that the Confederacy, though, is fractured. 
and they are able then to sue for peace. So the first major treaty happens between Native people and the new United States. And it's, it's different than other treaties because it's a treaty to end a war, right? And it's called the Treaty of Greenville. And Greenville is right here. But that Treaty of Greenville will be a huge secession of land in this area. It will also make peace. And it will also codify a group of people within Native American society, uh, the chiefs, who, didn't, who are now playing a role of negotiator rather than mediator, right? So the role of the chief has changed and, and there is going to be resistance to that changing role of the chief, where the chief normally would have been somebody who was elected to speak for people, right? Not to negotiate for them, but to speak for them. You don't come back with the decision you make on somebody else's behalf. You communicate a decision that's been collectively made. That's your role. But the way things are happening and the way the old society is being frayed by trade and colonial policy, these new chiefly people will rise up. And in response to that, Tecumseh and his warriors will rise up. And there'll be a competition over who controls these villages. So here's where we get, in that Treaty of Greenville, we get direct, absolute, from the Huron River people. So here you see the Potawatomis of Huron, and here are the actual clan signatures and clan signatures of the, and these would be the peacetime chiefs, not the wartime chiefs, uh, who signed the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. And you can, one of the interesting things is many of these are water clans. Uh, and so I think the, the Potawatomi of the Detroit region are a clan-based Potawatomi originally, uh, or one or two clans coming down here, because we find a lot of it is water clan. And then the main person negotiating on behalf of the Potawatomi, and again, this is a, a changed role from what you normally would have done, is this man here, Okia. And Okia his daughter is married to the God, into the Godfrey family and into the Whitmore family. So Whitmore Lake up there uh, is married into, into that family. And because of that marriage, the, and because remember how we say you become a family member, the white wealthy colonialists, Godfrey and Whitmore families will actually get Native American land because they were adopted. You know, the Native people will have to have moved out of here. They will get the land and be able to sell it at speculation prices. That's how treaties work. Uh, uh, and Okia at the Treaty of Greenville says something very interesting, which is we, I am here as a representative of the Huron of the Potawatomi. I am not speaking for the, all of the Potawatomi and we want a separate negotiation, a separate payment uh, uh, of these annuities than other groups. So we get a very separate Huron of the Potawatomi identity in these treaties and that will retain for the next, well, to, to to today, but this is the legal basis for that separate identity, right? So this is the treaty basis for that separate identity, and 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 it will be referenced uh, uh, in the legal papers that the Nottawa CP Huron Band of the Potawatomi would give in the in the uh, 17 or 1790s in the 1990s. Now here are two maps. What happens is, remember, all of the villages were around Detroit, and remember. They besieged Detroit and they lost that siege around Detroit. So you're, you know, if if you don't you don't live next to somebody you divorced, right? You don't live in the same house. You 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 try to move probably as far away as possible, right? So what you see is almost all of those, except the Huron, which will move, or the Wyandotte, which will move across the river to the Canadian side. Uh, almost all of the the villages will will move to where they wintered, right? So where they wintered and had had their hunting areas will now become their summer and main village areas. So we find probably by 1770, the, the Potawatomi are, are, state, are up here on the Huron in permanent villages. Uh, I think there's a relatively small number. What, you know, we, we do have some sense of the numbers back then. And remember, we're talking about 150 years now of disease. And probably the Potawatomi in this, Potawatomi of the Detroit region in this time period numbered something around 1,200 people. And about four or five villages with uh, lots and lots of hamlets and outlying areas uh, around that. But that's the numbers that the people in charge are giving at the time. And uh, there's, there's reason to believe that. So where is the village? Well, we've got a couple of maps. 
that are U.S. military maps and other maps, and uh, they tell us pretty clearly where the village was. So what you're looking at here, here's the Huron River. There's Brownstown. You see Brownstown right there. This is Michigan Avenue or the Sauk Road or the whatever they're calling it here. And you see where it crosses and you see Godfrey's Trading Post. Because what Okia has said, now remember, the, the Treaty of 1795 is the change from the American or the British here to the American here. Now the British, you, you just can't go out and trade with, you know, these are, these are official bodies that do that. It's the military, it's, you know, the government. Uh, you just can't go out and trade and you just, you're not just going to show up at a native, native village and say, hey, I'm here, I mean, you might not walk out. So you have to negotiate that and determine it, right? And so Okia says, what we want is we want our old translator, Sankriat, to become the our trading partner because we trust him and he's been our translator and he speaks. So a lot of the French people who were frozen out of the British regime because they were in the old French regime, they're brought back into the American regime because the Americans have no relationships with native people up here. They don't speak the language, all of that. So they need an intermediary. The British are not interested in doing that, but the old French who are frozen out from trading during the British period are interested in doing that. So that's why this, we call this the French trading post. Before 1795, it would have been a British run trading post, but we call it the French trading post now because of, our, because most of our history is confused and not understood. Uh, and so you see where this crosses the river and you see Potawatomi Village and Godfrey La Chambre trading post. So this is, again, that trading post is here because Okia requested it to be here as part of the negotiations in the Treaty of Greenville. It's not because these two plucky entrepreneurs came out here and put on their coonskin hats and decided to set up a trading post. That's not how it happened. It only happened by a negotiation. And then you see here, here's Ypsilanti. You see Indian Village, with, yeah, see where this is? And so if you, you do a little work and you figure it out, what you're looking at here is Galt Village, right off the Huron uh, Lake or uh, Ford Lake. So more or less kind of where Harris and um, Huron come together down there, more or less you know, within a quarter mile of that area is this village at this time. So not directly by the trading house, a little bit distant from it, but amazingly, if you sit on the bluff here without trees, you would have a direct line of vision to the Potawatomi graveyard that's on Water Street. So, um, and again, this graveyard would have totems and it would, it would have been visible, right? The landscape is very important to be able to see and reference things in a landscape, especially our kind of landscape, where there's very few things on heights that allow you to get a perspective is very important. So heights become places to have perspectives, view landscape, be viewed. They become very, very important. So that is where the village is more or less around 1800. There's another village near where Dexter is, smaller. There's another small village between, um, we're kind of, we're, um, let's say uh, uh, near Delhi, right, right there. There's a village where Dundee is, and then there's a couple of small villages on the uh, Northern Rouge River in where Southfield is now. We'll look at those. Okay, so let's think about treaties, and I know I've got, we're gonna go through all of this, but I know I gotta keep it going. So again, treaties, remember how we were talking about land? Treaties are not something that, and, and how these native groups in this area operated. A treaty is not how native people would relate to each other and how they would talk about land and deal with, that's not, right? You don't exchange, that's not the world. So this is an alien concept. The treaty itself is an alien concept. And it's about, and the treaties are have more to do with the needs of the United States than anything else. One, they, they are genuinely concerned about world public opinion. And they want to be able to say that they are negotiating uh, for this land and not just taking it. And so part of this is just performance for public opinion. Part of it, though, the really essential thing is this land to be in the market has to have a clear, it, it just must. And I, I can't stress that that's the only way it's going to be a viable piece of land to trade and sell is to have a clear pass and a clear legal pass that cannot be denied. So that's why this whole system is created of land division to create 
to allow for that. And they want to be able to sell it quick because they owe a lot of money and they need to make the taxes up. They, they raise, you know, they owe tons of money to France and stuff for the revolution. So part of this is to sell, sell the land quick, raise money to pay off their debts. Now, Native people don't have any right to sell any land at any point to anyone. It, it was never part of this world. So you have to create a new situation that would allow that and a new group of people, even a new class of people that would have the authority or thought to have the authority to do that. Now, this is going to be contested all the time, practically, politically, and even spiritually contested. Uh, uh, but so, you know, in some ways, treaties are the least legitimate thing I can think about that happened. And the idea that we should base anything on these truly terrible coercive documents, but they are the only legal recourse Native people have today. You know, if, if you have a right and to take it in court, it has to be a treaty right. Even, even to be a Native American in this country legally, you must be enrolled into a federally recognized tribe, which means a tribe that has a treaty with the United States. So only the United States government gets to decide who is a Native American, legally, who is a Native American and who isn't. How absurd. And based on these treaties. Now, let's think about what these treaties were for. Let's, Thomas Jefferson is very clear about what this situation is. To promote this disposition to exchange lands, this is a quote from Thomas Jefferson, which they have to spare which they really don't, but that's his view of it. And we want for necessaries, which we have to spare and they want. They, <laughs> we have goods, they have land. We shall push our trading uses and be glad to see the good and influential individuals among them run in debt. Because we observe that when these debts get beyond what the individuals can pay, they become willing to lock them off by concessions of land. So the role of the trading post is to get you in debt. It is not to trade goods with you. That's a very different role than the French had. They did not want the Indians in debt because it wasn't a cash economy. They would never get it back, right? They had to trade immediately for the goods. But the Americans, no, 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 you can pay us later. You must be in debt because they know this isn't a cash society. And they know that the only thing that they have is land. So these, this system was called the factory system. It was not made to trade. It was made to get certain, and look what he said, certain good and influential individuals, right? So the people who have authority, get them in debt, right? And so they're creating a class. They're, they're targeting people. They're targeting people, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is like like predatory lending loans a little while ago or whatever. They're targeting people. So that is the American view of both the land, Native people, this process. You see, that's Thomas Jefferson to William Henry Harrison. This is not an outlier. These are the main people in charge. Now, Tecumseh says to William Henry Harrison, now, in this process of becoming Native American, not just Ojibwa, Potawatomi, becoming Native American, how do you define yourself? What are the things that makes you Native American and not white? And for Tecumseh, this process has been clarifying because what makes you Native American is we have common land. What makes you white is you have private land. And so the common land, the notion of commonality of the commons becomes the central identity of, of what would become Tecumseh's third or fourth confederacy. And he says, and this is actually written down at the time. Now it's written by a translator, so it's not the exact words of Tecumseh, but they're as close as we're gonna get. The way, the only way to stop this evil, meaning the war that's going to come, is for the red men to unite in claiming a common and equal right in the land, as it was at first, as it should be now, for it was never divided, but belongs to all of us. No tribe has the right to sell, even to each other, much less to stay strangers. Sell a country? Why not sell the air, the great sea, as well as the earth? Did not the great spirit make them for a use of all of his children? These are two totally different worldviews. Totally contradictory worldviews about how to live and associate with the land. To the Americans, this is a commodity to speculate in. And, and believe me, that's not a light thing to say. We have a religion 
of land in this country, which is playing itself out every day, every day in all kinds of ugly ways, right? So it's it's not a small thing to say that a connection to land, I mean, because it allows you access to power. I mean, it's important in our society. It's not to be that, right? But it was also important to native people in, in a very different way. I think that's a remarkable speech from Tecumseh. And here's what the treaties did. So here's the treaties. This is how Michigan is divided by treaties. It's utterly unnatural. It has no basis in where people are actually living. Do you think that the Potawatomi didn't go beyond this line and had this, to, you know, even, even the maps should tell you this is all BS, right? Even the maps should tell you that. Okay, uh, so what we get is that defeat, the treaties that come, we get a post-colonial, you can imagine, there's not the war for the young men to get their authority by accomplishments in, you can't hunt anymore on the land because that's so there's a lot of people laying around drinking, wondering what to do. This is it's a it's a oppressed place, right? And within the midst of that, and now 1796, the US takes control. And you will get these treaties here. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But you get um, and then the Confederacy broke down. So you get a, a demoralized, uh, contradictory people. Uh, uh, people in some conflict. Thank you, Lisa. Um, are you telling me to go quicker? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, 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 you know, a kind of post, you, you need something to revive this, this. And this man, and people have probably heard of Tecumseh, but more important than Tecumseh is his brother. Uh, and his brother is, a, uh, Tecumseh's family are an important family. They're, they're a, a minor, from a, a, one of the smaller clans of the Shawnee. Uh, and warriors in one of the smaller clans. Tecumseh's father was killed at the Battle of Point Pleasant, fighting the Americans um, uh, in the early 1770s. And Tecumseh's older brother that he idolized. Uh, Tecumseh and his older brother went down to fight the Americans with their um, family members in Georgia, the Chickamauga and Tennessee. And Tecumseh's older brother uh, died fighting in, Chicka in at Chickamauga. Uh, Tecumseh's sister was also the, the most important woman of their village. So this is an important family. And this is Tecumseh's older brother. And his name, born name is Lela Wethika. And Lela Wethika uh, means the rattling, basically it means a noisy child, a noisy child. Now you can imagine you grew up in this family. You have the most... I mean, you have your your family died and fought and were major warriors. They have bones. You're not a warrior. He was not a warrior. You didn't have to be a warrior to be a man, right? You didn't. You didn't. If that wasn't your bag, that wasn't your bag. And 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 Lela Wethika was not a warrior. Um, and he got into real trouble drinking and stuff like that. And he describes getting drunk in his uh, in his cabin and falling face first into the fire. And having a vision in that fire of hell, and hell is not a, necessarily a native concept. So some of this revivalism actually has some Christianity in it. But he comes out of that falling into the fire, which just burns his face, and has a vision about the reconstitution of a traditional way of being in which the uh, American and European ways were not there anymore and a reconstitution of the old confederacy on a new basis not the chiefs the age of the warrior the age of the warrior and so he renames himself uh, and he renames himself Tenskwatawa the open door the open door and there are lots of people like this where you know you can imagine in this society this where people are looking and need um, a way out right need purpose They've had the, the old world, everything has changed in the last 10 years since Greenville. And, and what Tenskwatawa does is he sets up camp. Where does he set up camp? Next to Greensville, right? And he says, everybody come on down and hear this message. Hear this message. And he becomes known as the prophet, the prophet, Tenskwatawa, the prophet. So this is Tecumseh's older brother. And we know in 1807, uh, the same year that the treaty gives up the land we're on to where I'm on today here. Uh, and that would also be signed by Okia. And it will be the last thing he signed. He disappears. And I think he loses power in this community. 
uh, after that. Um, but the uh, in 1800, mo again, you can see where most of the villages are for the Potawatomi, 14 in Illinois, 21 in Indiana, only 11 around here and 80 in Wisconsin. So this is the smaller group here. But we know William Hall says something's going on. These, these really subservient Potawatomi on the Huron River have all skedaddled right when they're supposed to be gathering in the corn. And it's making me really nervous. They've just left the corn in the field. All of the young men have gone. Where did they go? They went down to Prophetstown. They went down to Prophetstown to visit with Tenskwatawa and hear the word. And that word spread throughout the Great Lakes and other people would become sort of apostles of Tenskwatawa, the prophet, or become prophetesses or prophets themselves. Men and women were, 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 were doing this. Uh, and Prophetstown becomes the center of the revival, the center of the revival. And the, unlike the previous Confederacy, which was really an alliance between the assimilationists and the traditionalists, and, I, and again, that's abroad and there's more complicated than that, but that's the way I'm going to use it. This is a much smaller Confederacy whose basis is a religious, spiritual revival. And so it has a different focus. It's millennialist. And one of the things that I think a lot of people will say it is desperate because there's no way that what they think they can accomplish can be accomplished. I think that's bunk. And, and I think that the idea that it was destined for Native people to be taken by the United States because civilization rolls up, that's bunk. There's lots of things that could have happened. The, the Britain could not have been obsessed with France and the Napoleonic Wars, and they could have been obsessed with what was happening here. And, uh, you know, lots of different elements could have happened to come together to make history different. And one of the things also I think is important that if you read history backwards, it all looks inevitable. You read it forward, and sometimes you throw the dice. And, you know, when, when people throw the dice and it comes up Trump's, okay, that's one thing. When you throw the dry dice and it comes up your way, then you look like a genius. Right, but what Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa are doing is they are they are not they are yes desperate, but they're not stupid. They are realizing what they're in is a very they're in a corner, but they've chosen to throw the dice right to see how they might land. Uh, now, are, does that make them braver than the more the assimilationists? You know, people were faced with incredibly tough decisions, and the most important decision was how will my community survive this. How will we survive this? And sometimes the, e the way to in ensure you were going to survive this was to assimilate, was to compromise, was to make a decision you never thought you would have to make, but you got to make it now. Does that make them less brave? No, it doesn't. But people, people came to the crisis in their community from different directions and they chose different paths. And it would lead to a civil war in these communities between the assimilationists and Tecumseh and his warriors. And Tenskwatawa would come into a village and say, witchcraft, you have come in here with your treaties and you are clearly evil. You signed that treaty and brought death and destruction on us. You are gone. There would be a trial. Some of the young warriors would dispatch the evildoer and Tenskwatawa would say, and now it is, it is the time of the warrior. Now we fight. And it wasn't just about fighting. It was about a religious revival. It was also an internal revolution within these communities against the chiefly caste, as much as it was a fight against the, um, the Americans themselves. Okay, so here's the War of 18, wow, we really are going through it. Here's the War of 1812, and it is a remarkable story. So here's where Detroit is, right? Here is um, that e-course. Here's where Pontiac did his, his meeting. So we have generations of headquarters of, of the Confederacy of Native American Resistance has been on this river. Here's where Brownstown is, right? And here's the Huron River, uh, Raisin River down there. And here's Jefferson Avenue. And the War of 1812 is not a war in this area between the United States and Britain over the Shanghai of some soldiers in the Atlantic and Mr. Madison's War. This is a war of resistance of Native people against the occupation of the Michigan and Ohio by uh, the Americans. And the aim is to push people back. There's a difference. And the difference between the, there's two factions of the Confederacy, one who will compromise on the Muskingum River 
and then Pensacola and Tecumseh said all the way down to the Ohio. But it's not, hey, we want Kentucky back either. It's that's they know what they're fighting. They're fighting for a specific place. They know what they're trying to get out of this. Uh, and and it's increasingly, you know, and and people keep coming to Prophetstown. So 1807. Now we're at 1811. For years they've been organized. There has there's been minor conflict, but people know it's coming. The main thing is Tecumseh wants to make sure that the Confederacy reaches deep into the South. And Tecumseh travels deep into the South to meet with the Cherokee, the Chickamauga, all kinds of people to bring them into the to, to this. And Tecumseh is the military leader. leader. Temskwatawa is not the military leader. Uh, Harrison knows that Tecumseh is out of town and Harrison moves against uh, Prophetstown. And uh, the prophet makes a decision to attack Harrison before he can get to Prophetstown. Now, I have heard some historians say Tecumseh scolds him. I don't know if that's the case or not. I think the prophet had to make a decision. Uh, in any case, they're defeated at that. So Prophetstown is dispersed by that. But that will be the only defeat in the first couple of years of the war. Uh, but okay, so remember, the War of 1812 begins November 7th, 1811, when the Americans attack Prophetstown. That's when it begins here. Uh, in June 18th, 19, 1812, the declaration of war. And then what happens is these are the Wyandotte villages. And so here's the Detroit, here's the road, down, and the British control Lake Erie. And so the only way to get to supply Detroit is by road from the Ohio River. And the United States controls all of it. And all of the villages here on this st st stretch are neutral Wyandotte villages. And so Tecumseh and a leading Wyandotte named Diatha, or Roundhead, who is more, who's senior to Tecumseh in all of this. Tecumseh we talk about, but there are many other leaders. And Diatha is a Roundhead, or round, was also called Roundhead. He's like the Che Guevara of, of the Great Lakes. He fights everywhere. He's a remarkable figure. He, it's a little unclear if he's originally from Sandusky or um, Brownstown, but in any case, he's making a claim on Brownstown. And uh, Roundhead, who will become, he was really the military leader of this, the native confederacy at this period, will give the Wyandotte villagers an offer they can't refuse. You're either with us or you're against us. Now, some of them decide to leave and go across the river and to get out of it, but most of them, including Walk and Water, make a decision, okay, okay, we're with you. And what that means is in, as come August, that all of the villagers here are now hostile to the Americans and they cannot get uh, they cannot get to the fort. So we're getting a second siege of the fort. And then you get several at attempts by the Americans to break out of that situation, <clears throat> which will be the Battle of Maguago and the Battle of Brownstown. One of them is a, a draw and the other one is a bad American defeat. Tecumseh at one point, I think with just six people, holds off 300. That's Tecumseh uh, at the Battle of, um, uh, 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 of the Creek there. And then... Uh, Michelin Mackinac Falls, and what happens is Hall feels that he is in a situation is untenable now because he's trapped from the north, the south, and Hall is the American commander in the fort. And so what happens? Detroit falls. Detroit in the War of 1812 surrenders to Tecumseh and the British. Now it'll be in the history books. It's they surrendered to the British, but did the British align these? You don't know. No. This, and even, even numerically, the Native Americans are much larger than the British in this conflict. Now, the British are there, absolutely. They're aligned, and, and uh, Brock is, one of the British generals creates quite a good relationship with Tecumseh. Uh, 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 remarkable, though, think about where the Huron River is. So here is Fort Amherstburg. This is the main British fort, main Detroit is the main American fort. This is the main British fort. Here's the Huron River. So it's right across from the Huron River. And that's for a reason, because remember, the Huron River is how you get through the entire southern Michigan, right? And so if you're coming even from Wisconsin, the first thing you'll see when you get out of the Huron River is Fort Amherstburg, right, uh, for the British. So that's important. So for the, for the Native warriors who are gathering from all over to fight this fight, it was really important for them to have access to Amherstburg and access to Fort Detroit. Guess where's a perfect place for that? Right around this area. So somewhere between Ipsy and Belleville and maybe on the Native American village that was right here becomes headquarters 
for Maine Pox, Maine Potawatomi Army. And for two years, this will be headquarters for the Maine Pox Potawatomi Army, while Tecumseh will headquarter lower down on the Huron to be right across from Amherstburg. A native warrior could easily make the 40 mile trip on foot in 24 hours from Detroit to, to Ypsilanti. I think, you know, all of us think that would be impossible, not for a well, a, uh, not for a young warrior. They could, they, could, they could do that and a whole group could do that. I mean, you would do it in 24 hours, but you could do it. So you're one day away from Port Detroit and by canoe, you're just, you know, you're like eight, 10 hours away from Amherstburg. So basically you're one day away from Detroit and one day away from Amherstburg by, by, by track. Uh, there, I don't want to go into the American side of the War of 1812 as it relates to Godfrey, but needless to say, Godfrey and those old French people who were frozen out by the British sided with the Americans and became spies against their former allies, the Native Americans who they were translators for. So the, 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 the traders made a decision, even though their entire livelihood was based on trading with native people, but if they supported the American cause, they could come out on the other side with Indian land. And that's what they did. So you get a betrayal of massive proportions by people who were the translators of native people to be able to get their land and get in a comfortable position for the post-war period when the war is over. Okay. Um, so August 16th, Detroit surrenders, siege of Fort Wayne uh, down, down there. Uh, and then, so there's an attempt to, to retake Detroit and a huge army comes up and makes it down to uh, Monroe, French town. Tecumseh is not there, Roundhead is in charge. And the Battle of Raisin, you know, remember the Raisin? That will be the largest defeat of the United States in the War of 1812. And it will be led by native people, uh, Stayatha. In fact, Stayatha, will capture the American general at that and strip him of his epaulets and his coat and take it himself, as that's what you did. Uh, uh, so it was a massive defeat. And, uh, and then people will remember the massacre, right? Uh, the massacre of the Raisin. Well, who got massacred? It's very interesting. The French people, the French traders who betrayed got their houses burned down, but they didn't get touched because they were, they're related. They're related. So the French people, by and large, of Monroe did not get touched. Who got touched? The Kentuckians. That is who was massacred, so-called massacred at, at, at uh, uh, Raisin. Not the French people living there. They, by and large, were untouched. There was another village, though, and for some reason it was on Swan Creek. That was completely wiped out during this period. Uh, and then the trading post here was burnt down during that period too. So this is a real rebellion, a real revolt. They took Detroit, they defeated the army uh, 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 that was came up to do Detroit. So what happens to change the situation? The Americans are able to defeat the British Navy in Lake Erie. And that way they're able to supply Fort Detroit over water rather than land. And native people can't do anything to stop that, right? And so what the British decide to do is pull back East. And so again, Native people did not lose this battle. The British people did. But the consequences are they're going to have to pull back east. And so that September battle is in is Lake Erie, and that's Perry, Perry's victory, that monument. And it's major. So uh, on October 5th, 1813, at the Battle of Thames, uh, the American army has caught up with uh, the retreating British and Native American army the British decide to flee the battlefield. The Native Americans have nowhere else to go. So they make a stand against the Americans, uh, uh, despite the British betrayal and they're taken care of. And Tecumseh, the greatest warrior of his generation is killed. It's unclear if Stayatha is killed at that point or he was killed or died earlier of disease. I've read both. My guess is Stayatha died earlier of disease, but he did die. Uh, and so this this is the defeat of the Confederacy. Now that doesn't mean that all the war, the war would not end until 1815, um, and the Huron River would be a very violent, hostile place until 1815. For uh, and a little bit after that, for Europeans, the war ends then. Again, it's a British betrayal. Uh, uh, um, uh, 
the British abandoned Detroit, the Alliance phrase. Mackinac Island is still held though. They still win up there. Uh, uh, and then um, interestingly, and we don't think of this happening here, but um, MacArthur, Duncan MacArthur, General Duncan MacArthur in October 14, he's coming from Sandusky and he's gonna do a raid to wipe out some more resistance a year later in Eastern Canada. And as he gets to Raisin River in Monroe Town, he's told that uh, up here, on, on right here at the village here, that Native people are gathering to for an attack. So he makes a, he, instead of going to Detroit over, he goes up the, up the Raisin River and then up the Saline and burns all of the villages on the Huron River and destroys all of the crops right before they're to be brought in, right? And he found most of those villages empty because people knew he was already coming. So again, the United States military burned all of the villages on the Huron River in October 1814. His name was Duncan MacArthur. We know where he lives. He has statues up named about him. This is not foreign history. This is not Western history. This is right here. What ends the treaty is, or the war is the Battle of Springwells. And that uh, Springwells is named for the area uh, where um, Fort Way uh, is today. Okay, so here's a little bit about that war. Here's the monument to Tecumseh where he was killed. Here's a, uh, an image of the the massacre at the Battle of Raisin. This most remarkable thing these trees were felled in early July of 19 or 1812 by the American military to create that road to get to Detroit. So we know exactly the day where they were felled. And when the water is low on the Huron River, you can still walk and see the old road that was created to, to serve Detroit and that Tecumseh took. So it's, it's, this is the road that Tecumseh took to make, you know, they created that road to help Detroit. Tecumseh took it to take Detroit. So Tecumseh walked this road right here. Stayatha walked this road. Main Pock and the Potawatomi marched to Detroit on that road. And you can see, still see the ax marks uh, on it. It's right down at the base of Jefferson. It's now part of the um, River Raisin National Battlefield. Okay, so Michigan post-war. Uh, the many defeated villages and communities relocate out west. So you, again, just like happens after Pontiac's Rebellion. But for the first time, we get uh, reserves in the southeast, uh, southern, southeast Michigan. So here's what the reserve looked like then. Now, again, here's the Detroit. Here's Detroit. Here's the Huron River. Here's two small uh, Potawatomi reserves. In, uh, it's one is in Berkeley and the other is in Southfield. This Reserve. This is an Ojibwa reserve up here, and it's up um, in Ovays. I can't remember the name of that town up there. Um, not Mount Clemens. I'm thinking of it. Uh, there's another small one on the east side. So the first time that there's the British are also creating um, reserves, and that reserve is still there for the Huron. A very large reserve for the Wyandot. And what happens is, remember the Wyandot were kind of neutral. Then they fought and then they made a separate peace. The Wyandotte here again are Christian, largely assimilated. They were largely pro-American. A lot of them were married into families. And they lived right here. So why are they moved up here? Thomas Jefferson literally says, and he, there's a document, that you know when people come up Lake the Detroit River to the Detroit land office to buy land in Michigan, the first thing they see is an Indian village. And boy, that's just, that's bad advertising. You got to get them off the Detroit River. So literally to be able to market Detroit, the Detroit land office, and ensure white settlers that there weren't Indian Indians around, even though these were very assimilated people, uh, and also to get out of the treaty obligations that University of Michigan is based on, the there was a new treaty that uh, dispersed the Wyandotte villages here, Brownstown, and then moved up here. But how how confused is this? Also the Shawnee move up here. So the Shawnee are an Algonquin speaking people, no relationship to the Wyandotte. And the leader of the Wyandotte community right here will be George Blue Jacket. So the half white, half Shawnee son of Blue Jacket will be leading the Wyandotte community. Because that's the way it works, right? That's how complicated it is. Here is Dundee and this is Macon's Reserve. And this is one of the only places in the landscape where the local community today has honored the old reserve and the old cemeteries. Ypsilanti has, hasn't done anything like they've done down in Macon. And then a very large old 
uh, 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 Odawa uh, trade or um, uh, reserve down on on uh, the Miami Lake Ma or Miami River. Uh, and in as late as 1919, and I, I encourage people to read this, you can read the American and the Native American version. But if anybody's ever been to or heard of Tonquish Creek, it's right near Plymouth. It's called Tonquish Creek. And Tonquish is a Native American leader of Wyandotte people who live in a couple of places around here. Uh, uh, and the Wyandotte are divided uh, between traditionalists and assimilationists, just like we talked about before. And Tonquish and his son are uh, uh, traditionalists. And there is a conflict with some leading American settlers. In fact, I, I can't remember. It's like Macomb or one of those guys. And they're actually shot and killed by those settlers. Some of the last Native Americans killed, and they're killed right at Tonquish Creek, right at Plymouth there. And the graveyard is for the graves of them are somewhere near there. But the consequences of that is some of the Wyandotte wish to have a, you have to do this for the sake of the people who died, a revenge killing. Otherwise their spirits won't be lifted and, and dead for dead, you know, to bury the dead, you need another body. And so the, the impetus is for them to attack. And there is a traditionalist, what was called a cult, based in the lower Huron River around a pool of water in near Oakwood's Met Metro Park and the underwater panther cult. And I don't have time to go into what that means, but it, it's shooting star, underwater panther. The world is divided into three planes and to be able to go through those planes is a remarkable power. And a panther is the only cat that swims and a shooting star falls from the, si the sky to the earth. And so those are reflections of the same being north and or above you and below you. And the, that panther that lives in the water in the Huron River is that powerful being, and and or that powerful oki, that power, and uh, and there and the traditionalists are aligned to that. And what happens is the assimilationists will attack the traditionalists to prevent them from attacking the Americans and getting all of the Wyandotte wiped out. So there's a, an internal conflict and feud in the early 1820s based on how to relate to the Americans here. Then, uh, so that's the, the last sort of violence in this area. Now, the Potawatomi who mainly live on the Huron River and the Raisin River have moved out west to the Nottawa Sea Feet Plains, sort of southwest of um, Battle Creek. Uh, Black Hawk is uh, uh, a leader out west, a Native American leader, and he continues to go all through the early 1830s to Amherstburg, and, and you can imagine how he gets there through the Huron River and all of that. And very interestingly, we have early reports of where Black Hawk stays when he's in Ypsilanti. And where does he stay? He stays right where Water Street is. Why? Because Water Street is the Native American burial ground here. It is the site of the old, probably the site of the old village that became the burial ground before the village did move down to Galt Village. So that, uh, so, you know, there, we have all kinds of indications of previous relationships here. Also, I think it's important to remember that Native people are living, Native people still live in this area from this time, right? All people did not leave. All people were not wiped out. Uh, it's clear that until the late, until the mid 1820s in Washington County, Native people are a majority. And it's clear that individual and households are around Washington and Jackson and Monroe counties well into the 1840s, well into the 1840s. Uh, uh, but by and large, this area becomes settled by the late 1820s. Uh, in 1836, 37 percent of Michigan land area is ceded. Uh, and again, so this took time. One of the issues we tend to think of like American settlers were, were like a, a wave of locusts just coming over and it was it was land poor, hungry, poverty stricken people. That's not at all what happened. Most of the land in Michigan, uh, you know, it's what the treaty with the British is 1796. They finally defeat the, the, the Native Americans in 1850. It's another generation before people settled this area. And there's a couple of different reasons for that. One is the reputation of this area is hostile and it's also has a reputation of being a swamp. Two, it's very hard to get here. Uh, until the Erie Canal opens, it's hard to get across the, you know, to take access to this area. And third, most of the land is being held by speculators out east and it's not available in the open market. So you had to, and one of the issues was you had to be able to buy 640 acres 
to be able to get in on this. I mean, the idea that a poor person could have even bought 40 acres back then, let alone 640, is absurd. And they kept having to ratchet it down to give access to people because the only people buying here were the George Washingtons and those kinds of people, right? So uh, George Washington did not buy here, those kinds of people. So what what we, we have a situation where the native, once the native uh, uh, right to the land was relinquished, it was still 40 years before they could sell this land and really get settlement here. And in part, it was the reputation that this area had as a hotbed of Native American resistance. Now, in the late 1830s, they make a decision for Native American removal entirely. And it's very interesting who is a part of that decision. So the Wyandotte will be uh, um, then as well. So the Treaty of La Pointe is the last Native American land session here. And one of the reasons is because the West is closing, right? And there's no, you can't, you know, uh, basically Wyoming is settled before the Upper Peninsula by, by Americans. So, you know, why you're, gonna, you're not gonna send people to Wyoming by the time you get to the UP, you might send people from Wyoming to the UP. Okay, so removals, evasions, and escapes. This is this remarkable story of survival. So this man here is John Maguago. He was born on the Huron River. His father, Maguago is a title as well as a personal name, right? So there are dozens of Maguagos, making it very, very difficult to, to, um, to do some of the research into this. But John Maguago is born on the Huron River and his father is a, um, a, a hereditary leader of the clan of the, and the village. And in fact, this area is likely called Maguago's town. A lot of times the, the towns were referred to by the senior, most important people in this town. And interesting, Neely, not, right, not Okia. So Okia has been disposed. Something has happened to Okia. That line is gone. And Maguago and the people who are much more resistant to treaties are, are, have leadership. A lot of people also go to Walpole Island. And Walpole Island and Hansard Island in, uh, in Lake St. Clair are unseated. They have not been seated. Uh, and in fact, um, there are a couple of areas that are legally unseated. They belong to Native people, 100%. They belong to Native people by law even right now. Uh, but Walpole Island is an important area. I look at a map of Walpole Island. It's very close to Detroit, and it's a large community of mainly Anishinaabe speakers uh, or Anishinaabe people. Uh, but a lot of people also went to... Um, uh, the UP to went to their communities, some in Potawatomi communities, some not in Potawatomi communities. But in 1833, there's the tr Treaty of Chicago and Lewis Cass. Uh, we all know who Lewis Cass is. And Lewis Cass is chosen by Andrew Jackson to be Secretary of War during the Indian removal period. So Lewis Cass, a Michigander, is the person in charge of Andrew Jackson's Indian removal policy. Why? Well, he has experience from Michigan. So, you know, when we think about Lewis Cass, and you see Cass Tech, and you, this is the, the architect of, and he's a vile, vile man. He knew what he was doing. The architect of that, he's a, a very famous Michigander with tons of things named after him in the landscape, but he was the Secretary of War uh, who, who was in charge of that. And that, what happened in Michigan and Ohio and Indiana was just as brutal as what happened for the Cherokee, the, this was a trail of tears. Uh, people were rounded up uh, by dogs and horses. Uh, interestingly, in Michigan, the entire operation, every last detail of it was contracted out to friends of the government for a massive amount of money. White people made out like bandits on the removal of native people from Michigan. And we'll look at that uh, in just one second. So uh, the troopers enter the riverine areas, rounding up Indians, some evade to Canada, some to North, many on to Kansas on their own without being pushed that way. Uh, many in the Huron Potawatomi either evade or uh, escape or they settle in Calhoun uh, uh, County and they hide out in the swamps uh, there. Uh, and this man, this is a really interesting question. Here we can read a letter from Union City, Michigan dated se September 19th states it's Potawatomi's who have been ordered by the government to be removed beyond the Mississippi manifest great reluctance to leave the state. 
They say that the treaty under which the government is acting, by which their lands were exchanged for lands beyond the Mississippi, was made by a few unauthorized chiefs who were cheated while they were uh, drunk. General Brady, who is the person who was in charge, the military person in charge of this, with about 200 regulars and 100 horsemen are quartered in Marshall, Michigan, from whence they have been making various excursions through the forests in pursuit of the Indians. They are secured without bloodshed and contracts to remove them have already been made by the head. Detail for each amount of, you know, like how much, how much money should an Indian eat in a day is discussed and how much can I get out of that, these negotiations. This man here is an amazing man and his name is Lucius Buell Holcomb, only get a name like that in the 19th century. And he is closely, he's a white man, obviously, and a settler down there, and he's closely related to these Indian communities and possibly even married into these communities. And he makes a deal with Moguago and others. I will, and he wants to be the one to take them. Uh, I will take you, and I'll, so we know that you're being taken by kindness and all of that, and I'll tell you what, if you really don't want to go, I won't make you go. And around Chicago, uh, there's something happens. Maguago's older father, or father is killed. We're a little unsure. I've heard he was killed because he refused to sign a treaty. I heard he was killed in the rebellion around Chicago. But this man, this white man, unites with Native people in a rebellion against the U.S. military to bring people back to the forests of Michigan. And he writes at the end of his life the most amazing diary, you know, kind of, you know, at the 19, you know, in 1900, looking back on this and, you know, wow, I was not even white, you know, just, just a, a different, a world different, you know, and that he had transgressed whiteness to be able to do what he did. Uh, and they were able to come back, and Maguago is able to come back, and they meet the other people who have evaded uh, capture in the swamps near um, Pine Creek, uh, and they are, and then the removal period is over, and the, a lot of the white people in that area did not want, they, they weren't hostile, there, there, there was no reason for them to be removed. And so one of the issues you get is uh, until then, the Native Americans operate collectively the land. And then after that, you get a decision to buy the land so you can get in on it. So money was raised by both Native people and uh, white neighbors to buy the land and then give it to the state in 1848 in perpetuity for Native people. So 120 acres on Pine Creek, which is where this community still lives. Uh, remarkable. I mean, far longer than they lived near Ypsilanti uh, today. What a remarkable story of perseverance. Of, you know, people think this is a story of genocide. This is a story of the failure of genocide in some ways, you know, like they tried and then this kind of thing happened. That community is still there. They are still there. Uh, it's called the, and now the Nadawasipi Huron Band of the Potawatomi. So I think that's a remarkable story. You can see here's how that went. Here's the Wyandotte Reserve, and here is, so what you're looking at here, here's a map of the Wyandotte Reserve on the Huron River. This is Oakwood's Metro Park, and what I've done is when, you know, when they sold the land, uh, uh, when the Wyandotte Reserve was liquidated and then they sold the land to put on market, they went in and did a very detailed map of where all the Indian farms were on this land. And you can notice they're nothing like American farms. They're not in those perfect squares, right? They relate to a different landscape than the, the Americans relate to. And right here where the Oakwoods Metro Park is, if you go down there and you go to the restroom or you go into the building there with the facilities at the Oakwoods Metro Park, that is Katie Quapaw's orchard. And she was one of the last traditional medicine people on the river, Katie Quapaw. And you can see all of the different names down here. So you can see there's Katie Qua, or Katie Qua, Qua my, uh, my apologies. Seneca Widow, Blue Jacket. So you can also tell Seneca Blue Jacket, these are not Wyandotte names, right? So these are, this is very interesting, large, you know, it's a Wyandotte reserve, but it's a community that created its own self and its own identity. Nearly 5,000 acres are uh, sold at auction. And uh, by, there are certainly people, Wyandotte people living in Michigan today. But there is not a recognized federal Wyandotte community, as far as I know, in Michigan today. 
uh, with most have been being removed. The vast majority of Wyandotte in the period where the removal happened in the 18th, this is much later, right? Most people got removed earlier, Wyandotte much later, they lived in Northern Ohio, Sandusky in, in that region. Okay, there's Lewis Cass, we believe if the Indians do not emigrate and fly the causes which are fixed in themselves, meaning, mm -hmm, right, they're Indians, and which have proved so destructive in the past, they must perish. This is genocidal, everyone. This is genocidal. So you can see where these removals happen. And we often talk about these removals, but this was a major area of removal. Here on the east is a, or on the right is a really interesting map that shows you the settlement of Michigan. And one of the reasons Michigan has more Native American reserves than almost any place east of the Mississippi is because by the time the northern Michigan is settled, the West has already been settled. There's, you know, there's no removal out West, right? There, that's just not the reality. And so, you know, parts of the UP are majority Native American until well into the 19th century. And then I think it's Luce County is currently about 18% Native American. So this area is still very Native American. This area here, uh, you can see how late that was uh, uh, settled. That's Waganathiki and that's an Odawa homeland. Uh, which has been continuously Odawa and was majority Odawa 100 years ago, or maybe a little bit more, but not much more than that, uh, and still has a very Native American presence. So one of the things to look at Michigan is one of the, you know, Michigan's Native population is the reason why it is where it is, is in part this history, right? And the fact that our upper peninsula uh, uh, for various reasons is not settled until after, you know, Alaska is settled. Okay, so here's this 1842 removal, and I just want to look at a little bit at this. I, you can go through all of these documents. They are absolutely fascinating documents, and it's federal policy, right? So everybody with their hands in the jar is writing a document, and, you know, it's about money, so people are going to be taking it. So you get all kinds of claims. So remember, once Native people are removed, all of the traders who've made their life uh, livelihood trading with Native people are not going to get that trades, and they're white. So what it, They've got a claim. So they make a claim on future trade with Native people that they're not going to get to the American government. Far, far, far more money is paid out to white people in the trading, treaty process than Native people. And in fact, the main people negotiating the amount of money going to the Native people are the traders themselves, because that's the amount of money owed to them by Native people. So you wouldn't even get the money. Most of the negotiations in these treaties the real nuts and bolts is between the white traders and the U.S. government over how much they should get for the Indian removal. Not a joke. Most of those discussions are about that. And then all kinds of people go, Southwest Michigan, they, people will go, well, you know, if you're going to pay for these, if you're now responsible for these Indians here, I once helped a Native woman who was sick. What do I get for that? And people make claims for literally everything. Every single thing, white people are making claims. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Ten times the amount paid to Native people in annuity is going to white people for their claims for Native people leaving. And then beyond that, all of the removal policy, how much food will it cost? How many horses do you need? How much grain for each horse? All of that is going to be determined by these contracts, right? And how much money per head? And one of the things that they get into a debate about is if a Native person dies on the way, will I get paid for the full trip or do we have to do we do it by day, by week, by hour? And then the guy writes back and goes, hey, look, you're doing the best you can. I'm just going to err on the side of the whole time, whether they die or not. Right. So so this is the treatment. And you can imagine if this is this treatment. This is built into these treaties, right? All, the treaties look and sound like a massive ripoff with white people pocketing not just the land, but huge amounts of money, right? And, and that's really what, that's why there are so many treaties in some ways. It's not because the indigenous people were demanding them. It's not because there's so many, in, it's because they were opportunities to make off like bandits. And some of the wealthiest people in early Michigan, this is where, huge amounts of their money come from. There, the analogy is Haiti having to pay France for the um, 
the end of slavery. And that's why Haiti is poor and France is rich. If France had to pay Haiti for slavery, perhaps France would be poor and Haiti rich. But who has power? Who doesn't? Haiti can't send a navy to France demanding it send money back. France can send a navy to Haiti. Okay, Ypsilanti's relationship, and we're almost done, friends. Ypsilanti's relationship, Ypsilanti does not have a Native American history. Again, Ypsilanti is founded in 1825 over the remains of a Native American village that was largely, dis was only dispersed to allow for the Ypsilantis to begin. You cannot get an Ypsilanti if Native people are still living here. You cannot get an Ann Arbor if people are still living here. So one of the ways to think about Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor and Washtenaw County is the only way they can exist is the denial of another people, the right to exist. That's the contest. Who gets the right to exist on this land? And uh, in, th in that contest, the, the American settlers won. And I think the idea that Ypsilanti wants to celebrate its Native American heritage which I've often been asked to even speak at, Ypsilanti doesn't have a Native American heritage. It has a, a colonial heritage. Now this land has all kinds of Native American heritage, but if we're gonna equate Ypsilanti with the heritage, that's just totally a false reading of history uh, and what happened to create Ypsilanti. So yes, Ypsilanti has a Native American, the, the land Ypsilanti is on absolutely is completely rich with Native American history. But Ypsilanti begins in 1825 on the basis of denial of that claim to this land. So please don't talk to me about the first Ypsilantians or something like that. I really find that distasteful. Here is the, 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 the great and the good of Ypsilanti. There are literally half or maybe even a dozen mayors here and they are celebrating Ypsilanti's 100th anniversary to dress up like Indians. Now, do you remember when I showed you the picture at the front? Okay, here are the actual descendants at about the time that picture was taken. These women are the actual descendants of the men those think they're, that they're celebrating. They live 90 miles from Ypsilanti. At this moment, this picture is taken. And this is what these men think that Native people look like and how they should celebrate them because they have an imagination. It has nothing to do. They're, they're imagining their own role in this society as white people beating savage Indians. And the more savage they are, the more valiant was my fight, et cetera, et cetera. It has nothing to do with the reality of the people living 90 miles away. And they don't even bother to ask. This, again, this is the same time period. Lots, and the person who did this festival, the person who designed the festival was Ypsilanti's Daniel Quirk, who really liked to paint his face different colors. He, he liked blackface. Here we see also Ypsilanti, I, the, the cemetery on, and we know exactly when that cemetery uh, was active because there's trade silver in the cemetery. And the trade silver is only in the British period. So 1760 to 1850, do we find trade silver? And that's precisely the time that the Potawatomi village is in this area. So that cemetery relates to the Potawatomi village. Here. There's no doubt about it. That's the only group of people that cemetery can relate to. And so we've seen over the years, we've seen about, I've got about a dozen articles of a dozen different occasions in which that, because that's a gravel area, it's where gravel was taken from, which is also why it's a cemetery. It's easy to dig and it drains the water so bodies don't wash out and stuff like that. So the reason it was dug for gravel is the same reason Native people had a burial there, but it was dug for gravel repeatedly to build the railroad tracks here in Ypsilanti, and, and these things were uncovered. And some of the things uncovered are remarkable. One is a big medallion saying from the King of Spain. So remember that's when Spain was in, in St. Louis, and the person wearing the big medallion, my guess, was a, was a, was a serious figure. You see a kind of racist attitude towards them, D dug up seven little Indians. And then just the wholesale looting of these graves, the wholesale looting of these graves. And it's clear, even some of the, there you see King of Spain, even some of it says, you know, the bodies, were, these weren't ancient burials. You can, they even say there's, we saw textiles and when we lifted them up, the textile fell apart. So these weren't ancient. Uh, and uh, I am 100% sure doing archeology span and what I know about the past that Native American remains still are there. 
Uh, and if they're not there, that's the spot where they were. And so it's sacred. And so Ypsilanti has a Indigenous Peoples Day and that land is up for sale. So if, <laughs> I'm not sure if I believe your Indigenous Peoples Day if you're willing to sell the Native American or, and not even recognize it because to recognize it, uh, places a barrier on selling it or a barrier on selling it. So the city has been extremely reluctant to recognize that burial there, even though the State Historic Preservation Office, the State Archaeological Office, the Nottawa City Huron Band themselves all recognize that burial there. But it's hard to sell land with a native burial on there. So the city just, I mean, I, they keep telling me, oh, there's nothing there, because that's what they hope. That's what they hope. At least some of them do. Okay. Uh, here's a, and we'll break it up here, but here is a look at Ojibwa, Odawa, and Wyandotte communities. Um, again, Ojibwa, huge um, territory from Saskatchewan to Quebec, uh, Ojibwa territory. And then, oh, I'm going to have a light turned on for me. We're almost done, every, everyone. And then you want to look at Oklahoma territory. And if you look at the east in this little area there, you'll notice most of those are Midwest native people. So you see the Quapaw, the Peor, the Modoc, Wyandotte, the Seneca, Cuyahoga, Miami, others, Eastern Shawnee. So much of the people there would, would be there. And then the other interesting thing is you, you notice there's the citizen Potawatomi and then the prairie Potawatomi. And there's another split uh, uh, out when people arrive in Kansas and of course, there's another removal to Oklahoma. But when people arrive in Kansas, people are given the opportunity to take citizenship or to retain um, uh, traditional structures. And so you get a division, the cit citizenship Potawatomi and then the prairie Potawatomi. Uh, so here is, the, again, here's uh, 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 more of the story of the Nadawa Sipi Huron Band of the Potawatomi. Here's John Maguago's grave. It's over in, in there. Here's another picture of the, uh, the villagers uh, from, from the reserve. And again, compare that to how the white Ypsilantians at the same time were honoring that past. This is um, uh, Phineas Pompati, and he would be the last hereditary chief of, of, the, of the, the band. And now you decide on a, on a different basis. Uh, and again, in 2007, there's a new community center, health center are built. They, the, the, tribe owns the Firekeeper's Casino, so now has an income and is able to, um, to help uh, with facilities. The, the reserve looks great. Here's where Potawatomi reserves are in the United States today. And look, Michigan, even though Potawatomi are, are not native to Michigan, of course they are, right? Because it depends on your time frame. Uh, that you're looking at and, and still very well represented here in, uh, in Michigan. Uh, and then here's a closer look at the Michigan communities. There are 11 right there is the Nottawa CP Huron Band of the Potawatomi. So again, less than 100 miles away from Ypsilanti are the people, the descendants of the people who were born here, who lived here a generation or two or three in the Ypsilanti area and have lived far longer over here. In fact, the, the longest I know of the Potawatomi have lived anywhere is, uh, is in that area right there. And then the last thing I want to show you is this is from Standing Rock a few years ago. And here are different Michigan uh, tribal bodies at Standing Rock who went to Standing Rock. And that is just to say, again, to underline, people are still very much still here. And that struggle that we've been talking about for the last 200 years is still an ongoing struggle. The land is still contested. Rights to the land are still being sought. Uh, rights, uh, the, the notion of the land as a commons or the notion of a land as the private domain of, of Mountain Ice Company is still a contest in this landscape. We have not yet decided that. Uh, it's been decided for a very long time uh, in one way, but it, it, it's not a done issue. Native people have made it and continue to make it a live issue. And in my mind, part of justice, part of a decent world to live in, part of a redress of colonialism uh, uh, means redressing that dis those disparities that come up in this. And it means, it means to me taking down those fences 
those fences that were the requirement of colonialism. If we want a non-colonial environment, we need to think about this land again and reassert it is a commons. It is not the private purvey of one or two individuals. We can only live on this land if we live on it as a commons and we live on it together. We don't need those fences to live on this land. In fact, those fences are killing us. Thank you very much, and I would be happy to take uh, a number of questions.